This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. SMC Podcast Network. My name is Chris Blades, and before I get started today, I want to make sure I take the time out to remind you, as always, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast, make sure you never miss an episode, make sure I was on top of when we drop related stuff. Also, if you could, please as well, give us a five-star rating, or ask us a review, very appreciated, very helpful, allow us to see what you guys like, which I just like the ways you can improve, all that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media, so you can find us there, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we can talk, we can chat, we can debate, we can discuss, and there's a lot to discuss. From a very action-packed sports weekend. There's a lot to discuss just from today. Obviously, I'm recording this on Sunday. Um, like I said, a lot to discuss from the NFL slate. Talk about uh, the Bills looking like the real deal. Talk about how um, the Saints are going to be in an uphill battle in their division. Now, having dropped two straight. And their quarterback... It, apparently the one that we thought looked old in game in week one actually is not the one that looks as old though I mean better weapons we we'll talk about that talk about the Packers looking good we can talk about um Dan Quinn I I, I don't understand how he has a job after week four um we can talk about Adam Gase I don't understand how he'll have a job after week four either but we're going to talk well we're going to start at least the the conversation Talking about the the, the NFC East. And I say this due to the fact that I think this could very well be the worst division in football. Again. Like last year, it was bad. Like 9-7 won the division and it was like a very bad 9-7. Like the Eagles got to 9-7 because they won their last four division games, which is obviously impressive and all those different things. The division games aren't easy. But... They said someone had to win a division um, and get into the playoffs. So I mean, it's not the worst. It's not like the worst record to ever or to ever get into the in, into the playoffs or anything like that. Obviously, there's been under 500 teams that have made the playoffs before. Um, Seahawks, the 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 beast quake year, and I think uh, I think there was I think there was a seven and nine. I think there was like a seven eight and one team that made it. Um, which again, funny enough, could be the record of one of the teams that make it this year. But that's assuming the Eagles get to seven wins, which they probably won't. So, you know, there is that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you just look through this division. And the Giants may be worse than they were last year when they were bad and had the, what, number four pick? I think they picked Andrew Thomas at four. So they had the fourth pick. You have Washington, who's better, but, like, not that good. So, all right, they might not have the number two pick, but they're still not going to win that many games like Dwayne Haskins the offense is still not all there um so there's that Dallas it looks basically the same as they did last year where any bad team or well yeah any bad team they're probably going to beat and a lot of good teams are going to struggle with um and again they took them uh literally historic collapse which I mean would have been historic I guess had it not happened again the next weekend to the same exact team um which, again, we'll talk about them in a second. But so you need that just to win their only game of the season. Like, if that hadn't happened and, and the Falcons could just recover an onside kick, they'd be 0-3. And then you have the Eagles, who are clearly worse than they were last year when they weren't that good. Um, obviously, no, injuries and other things you could point to, but a lot of teams are injured. The, I mean, the Niners are injured. Out, they have injuries out the wazoo. And they dominated the Giants. And I will tell you that if the Eagles played the Giants sun, like on Sunday instead of playing the Bengals, it would not have gone that same way with less injuries. 
Um, so there's that. I mean, that's just a uh, quality of a good coach. Um, but yeah, like they're definitely worse. And they had one of the nastiest ties I've ever seen. And I guarantee ties don't happen that often. But like this tie wasn't even like a competitive, like back and forth, like, oh, it just so happened. To, like both teams like kick field was an overtime kind of tie. This was a like, oh, these teams aren't that good. Um, and the Eagles needed a drive at the end of regulation just to even get just to tie the game, which again, I would contend going for two there would have been better served for everyone involved. At least you got a definitive um, outcome from it. And again, you're putting a lot of faith in an offense to score in overtime that had not shown the ability to consistently score throughout the game. So that's, I mean, a separate point. But that's not even the worst decision of the game. Um, obviously, things happen. There's punts back and forth. No one can really move the ball. Um, the Bengals, just because they, the Eagles' defense play a little better, and the Eagles, because they would move the ball, and then they get around like the midfield 40 yard line area right right at the edge of field goal range then you have like penalties and lost yardage and different things like that and it was just like anytime you thought like oh okay this is probably what eagles gonna win they just found a way not to win and hence we're here with the tie um so yeah so then it gets okay so they they get they get to like a third and seven with like 30 or no like 20 seconds left they throw a slant um that drops incomplete i don't know what the plan was there because barring him running that for a touchdown, like, you're going to have to, if he catches it but it's short of the first fourth down, or short of the first down, you're going to have to go for it and then spike it because, like, I don't I don't know what the plan was there. Um, but whatever. Um, so then they get that. It's incomplete. So, boom, they um, they tried out um, for a 59-yard field goal. They get a false start because, of course, they do. Why would you, why would good things happen? Um then from 60, which would have been like a 64 yard, they're just like, ah, nah, we're not going to do it. We're going to punt. And I'm like, either A, kick the field goal. Because again, if you didn't think, I mean, the chance of him making 59 yard are, are slim. Obviously, the chance of him making 64 yard are less, are less than that. But it's like, what's the difference? Like, there's a slim, there's a slim to zero chance he makes 59 yard. Just say there's a slim to zero chance he makes 64 yard. Like, if you had enough confidence... From 64, it's not like, um, it's not he was going to, like, lighten up a little bit on 59 yards as opposed to 64. He's still going to try to kick it as hard as he could. So, again, it probably wasn't going to work. I mean, 64 yards are hard to kick. Like, it's, it, I'm not saying it was going to work out or it was going to go well or anything like that. Like, they probably, he probably would, Jake Elliott would have missed the kick. Most likely. But, though, he did hit a 61-yarder against the Giants. Um, so, there's that. And that one just barely snuck in. Um, but still, I'm just like, all right, the chance of him making the kick are slim anyway. But, um, obviously, after the false start, all right. So, even if you don't think he can make the kick, I don't see why you don't, like, go for it. Because it's not like the Bengals defense is that good. The few times you try to throw the ball down the field towards the end of the game, they got multiple pass interference penalties. So, I mean, it's not like you have this great secondary. They were able to get guys open down the field, i.e. Miles Sanders on the left sideline on a nice little sluggo route on a linebacker that Wentz just missed him on. So, I mean, hey, if you don't think Wentz is going to hit the guy, that's a separate point, which is fair at this point because he's playing terribly. Um, but I just don't understand the logic behind being like, yeah, we're going to play for the tie against the Bengals. The Bengals. Like, in a couple of weeks when they play, like, the Ravens, if you want to play for the tie then, if you have the opportunity, all right, it's a different story. The Ravens are actually a good team. Tying, like, as a, as a bad team like the Eagles are, if they tie the Ravens or beat them, that'll be very impressive. And tying the Bengals just makes you look like even more of a disaster than before. Because, again, it's, you, clearly you couldn't beat them. And then, like I said, you didn't, you didn't even try to, to I mean, you didn't even try at the end to beat them. Like, clearly you couldn't beat them in regulation. And then once you got to overtime, you didn't even try. I'm not saying they didn't try because they tried to move the ball and things. But once it got to like, oh, we'll give it a shot. They didn't even give it a shot. And they were just like, yeah, we'd rather punt. Well, Doug was like, yeah, we'd rather punt. And it's going to be funny because by the time you hear this on Monday, he's probably will have re- retracted and be like, you know, we probably should have kicked or we should have went for two there at the end of the game, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, like, of course, that's easy to say then. But it's like the same logic that would have that applies now applied then in the decision time. It was like, do you want to try to win the game? If the answer is no, then punt. Cool. I'm not saying he would have been the only coach to punt. There's a lot of coaches that would have tried to punt in that given that scenario, especially after the uh, fall start. But again, I five yards is a big difference, but I'm like, the chance of him making a 59-yarder was slim anyway, and you're going to try that. So, like, 
moving it back five yards, I was like, all right, we might as well give it a shot. If we if he misses it, all right, they're at the fifty yard line with like twelve seconds left. Tackle him inbounds. The tie, you have so basically you're saying not only do you have zero faith in the offense to get an onside to get convert convert a, convert excuse me a fourth and twelve. You have zero faith in the defense to be able to not give up like like what. Like ten, fifteen yards for a good, um, for for like a legitimate field goal opportunity, or you don't have any faith in your field goal team to block it, and then you don't have any faith in Jake Elliott to make a long kick. Then again, obviously sixty four, it's excessively long, but like still, like it just at some point, I, I don't imagine how that will play in the locker room among the obviously this they won't say anything bad on the outside, but it's inside the locker room. And just like, it, it speaks to a coach. I just like, this team is not that good right now. We got to take whatever many wins we can get. And because they, they tied, they were the only team in the division not to lose today. So the Giants got smoked. The Wa- Washington, I lost by two scores. And then the Cowboys game, which was actually at least entertaining. So give them that. And that's, like I said, the, they're basically the same thing. They were actually going to be a great offense. It's going to score a lot of points. When you put them up against a good team, like the Seahawks or a good offense, they're going to struggle. And like all, I mean, not as much in the second half, but all, all in the first half. Seattle play action just had guys running open deep every time they wanted to. Tyler Lockett had what three first half touchdowns, I think. DK Metcalf would have had a touchdown in the first half if he didn't. I, I don't know what he was doing because at least Deshaun Jackson, when he did that, he was by himself. So he was like, "Oh yeah, I thought across the goal line or." Um, so, like, all right, he let the ball go. Like, DK Metcalf had a guy chasing him. It's not like he didn't, like, unless he thought the guy fell. Like, it's not like he didn't know the guy was behind him. Like, you knew you beat him. All right, cool. But it's not like you didn't know the guy was behind you. And he just let up and then Trev- um, Trayvon, I think, I don't know if it's Trevor and Trayvon, but I think it's Trayvon, uh, Diggs, Stefan Diggs' brother, had a nice play. He, he didn't give up on the play and poked the ball out because DK Metcalf slowed up and didn't tuck the ball in. It didn't make any sense. I don't know what. I don't know if he thought he was closer to the goal line. Like I don't. I have no idea what was going on. Eventually, he did redeem himself with a touchdown late. But still, it's like even that game. All right, the Cowboys competitive. They're down fifteen points again in the, in the second half. After I think this was after the Dak fumble because the yeah the Seahawks scored right before the half and then like they got the fumble. To open that, they were down fifteen. So again, this is a lot more time to make up the lead than it was um, against the Falcons. Yes, they they were able to make up the lead. They were able to get it. Um, they were able to take the lead eventually with the field goal, and then again because their defense isn't that good, they they allowed a drive to go down the field. DK Metcalf catches a nice nice pass on a like a a deep over. I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know exactly what the what the route was, but we're going across safety's face. Um, clearly the corner who was out there thought he was going to continue. Um. Um, was thought the safety would have seen him and then would have continued to run with him. But once he crossed his face, DK Metcalf was too fast, and it was all over from there. The rest threw a nice ball because that's just what he does. He throws a nice, a nice deep ball. Um, and anything that he has to put loft on him just looks like he drops out of the sky perfectly almost every single time. It's very impressive. Um, they touch on his deep on his deep passes. Because yeah, so he caught that, and the Cowboys had a chance. They had a nice drive. They, they were able to move the ball because they were just – Seahawks were just allowing them to dink and dunk their way down the field because they knew, again – Due to the fact they were up seven, they knew the Cowboys needed a touchdown, so it's not like they were just giving up yards to end the field goal range. They're like at some point, the Cowboys have to try to go for the end zone, and they did on their last playoff offense. Um, and Dak did a great job of not coming down, um, or oh, not going down on a sack. He was able to maintain his feet, stay up, but then unfortunately, instead of just like throwing the ball out of bounds or in lower living to see another down, tried to force into the end zone and got picked off. I mean, he had a good game otherwise. Too, I think he's like the first. The Cowboys quarterback, I mean, not first Cowboys quarterback, obviously, but he's, I mean, they haven't had a back to back 400 yard passer in a while. And obviously, he was that. I believe now he has the, the record, too, for most, um, the most 400 yard passing games with six. I thought I saw that on Twitter. I could be wrong about that. Cowboys fans, please correct me. Um, I thought he passed Tony Romo to give him six. Um, but yeah, so at least that was a competitive game. Like, that's. It was a game that hurt for the Cowboys because they lost, but like it was a much more entertaining and competitive and fun game to watch than was the Eagles Bengals or was the Giants Niners or was the Browns. Well, depending on who your team is, or was the Browns um, um, Washington football team game. So again, the, the Cowboys are probably win the division because like they have the best offense, and I think they're going to beat up on the NFC East because the 
Eagles aren't that good. The Giants aren't that good. Like I said, that should be three to four wins. They might split one with the Giant with the Eagles just because. And then Washington is like a weird one because like their defensive line is like pretty good. Their front seven isn't bad. Secondary is like eh, depends. And then um, their offense is not really that great because Dwayne Haskins isn't that good right now. Though, like I said, um, it, it's it's hard to say that when you're in a division with Daniel Jones who hasn't looked great at all. Or Carson Wentz, who hasn't looked great at all. So it's like, I'm saying he's bad, but also, like, he's maybe better than the other two? I don't like, not maybe, I mean, well, this season, obviously. Not, like, if I were going to, if I were coming to the season, he would have been third or fourth. But right now, you could make it the argument for him being second. Just because, again, he hasn't looked like a complete disaster out there. And at least he's gotten a win, and which matters. So there's that. That'd be a good win for the Seahawks. Obviously, they go to 3-0. And, again, they, they did it with some injuries. Jamal Adams missed uh, the most of the second. I mean, I, well, definitely most of the second half. I forget when he got hurt. But it was with a groin injury. He's out there, though. I don't understand why he was standing up. It just seems like it was a little dangerous. Um, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, they got the win there. The Packers, like I said, were able to outduel the Saints in another very entertaining game, 37-30. to Their offense continues to look good, even without Devontae Adams. Um, and Rodgers, too, for over it. 280 yards, three more touchdowns. Alan Lazard had himself a day, six for 146 in a touchdown. Aaron Jones at 69 yards on the ground, a touchdown. Um, so, yeah, like I said, they had a, they had themselves a good game, and Aaron Rodgers continues to be the petty person I know he is, and he is going to go out there and have a great season because they picked Jordan Love, or at least he's going to try it. I don't know what it'll look like by the end of the year. Um, but at least for now, he's going to go out there and have a great season because they picked Jordan Love. And he was pissed about that. I mean, didn't say it outwardly, but like, yeah, I mean, come on. It's Aaron Rodgers. So you knew he wasn't happy about that. He's going out to show them like, yeah, Jordan Love's not going to see the field anytime soon. And like I said, he's, I think, well, he's not on Russ, which I mean, Russ on different level. He has 14 touchdowns in three games, which is, because when they have said that on the broadcast, I thought that was a record. And it turned come to find out it is in fact a record um, for the most touchdown passes in, in a three, in the hope in the season through three games. I mean, just absurd. He's on pace for what is that? Um... 14 touchdowns in three games. Times that by six. He's on pace like... Well, he'd be on pace for like seven. Is that is that right? 14 divided by three is like five. And then... Yeah, he's on pace for like 76 touchdowns. Which obviously he's not going to hit. But like... He might get to like 40 or 50. Like that doesn't seem out the realm of possibility at this point. You have 30... You have 14 in the... In the first game. I mean 14 in the first three games. You need 36 the last 13 to get to... Uh, um, to get to fifty, and at this and that would lower his average touchdowns per game. At this point, he's at like almost five a game, and now that no that to average thirty six or to get thirty six for the rest of the season, he'd have to I think what thirty six divided by thirteen. That's like no what thirty six oh, uh, divided by thirteen is like I mean, my calculator is not working. Thirty six divided by thirteen. Is like two point seven touchdowns. So again, not impossible. Um, but we'll see. Like I said, MVP Russ is still very much alive and well. Also in the NFC. Well, um, just one more quick thing on the Saints. Um, Drew Brees looked somewhat better. I don't know. Um, Alvin Kamara had had most of the targets, so he had thirteen catches for one hundred thirty nine yards, two touchdowns. Obviously, he had the long fifty. Yard, which was a great play and slash or bad tackling, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but just great play, great balance from him to be able to stay up. And great play from the, the center, Eric McCoy, to get down there and block for him out in front. Um, but yeah, that was, um, he does not a whole lot of downfield work, not a whole lot of wide receiver work. Um, Emmanuel Sanders had four catches. Uh, Tremont Smith. Oh, Traquan, excuse me. Traquan Smith had four receptions. So, again, a lot of it was underneath stuff. A lot of it was stuff to, like I said, to come out of the backfield or within the 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So, that, I mean, you, that's just what Drew Brees is, and that's what he's going to be this year. I mean, he's what he's been throughout most of the year, but now, see, with without Michael Thomas, it makes it so he's going go to go to the guy he feels comfortable and the guy he feels comfortable with, which is reasonable in my opinion, is Alvin Kamara. He's going to throw the ball to him a lot. So I don't know how they're going to navigate that because they got to figure that out. Though, the Lions next week, the Lions aren't that good. Though, they did pick off Kyler Murray three times, so they derailed their little, um, I don't know if we're going to call it a hype train, but just a little bit. 
and Kyler Murray looked a little bit more human, at least through the air. Running the ball, he shook Jeff Okuda out of his shoes. It was, I mean, that was disgusting. I felt bad for Jeff Okuda. He's been, he's had, a, he's had a, but he got the pick. He got the pick later in the, in the game. So that helps his case. Like I said, they, they were able to, they got three picks off Kyler. So and not exactly his best day. Um, but let's see if they, we'll see if the Cardinals can bounce back against the Panthers next week. Um, I said the Lions got their first one of the season. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else exciting that happened in the NFC. Um, oh yeah. Oh wow. I didn't get to talk about Dan Quinn yet. You know what? Um, Dan Quinn's in a lot of time. So I'll talk about him, um, <laughs> in the beginning of the next segment. And then we'll talk about the, the big, uh, performances and big games and, the, um, the good wins from teams out of the AFC. So we'll discuss all that right after the break. Stay right there. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Dan Quinn, I know you didn't think I forgot about you. Like, I meant to talk about you in the last segment, but um, the MCU, obviously, like I said, gave me a lot to talk about, and your game just didn't happen to to be, obviously, like, you hit the Sunday night game and other games, so I was like, oh, okay, like, I'll get to them when I get to them, and like I said, just forgot to touch on you, but Dan Quinn, you have to be on the hottest seat in the NFL right now, easily, because, yeah, it was hot last year, and yet, for whatever reason, Arthur Blank decided, you know what? The defense started to turn around a little bit after he just stopped being the defensive coordinator, which again I don't know if I don't know how that doesn't tell you like, hey, maybe he shouldn't be calling the shots. Um, but whatever. He even started to turn around, they played a little bit better. So it's like, all right, you know what, we'll give you one more chance. Which again, I wouldn't have, but that's just me. I'm I'm again I'm not an owner. I've never been in that position, so I've never had to make those kind of decisions. But then for me, I'd be like, you know what, I've seen enough. But again, they gave him another shot. So all right, cool. I come out this year. Um, you're going to see, like, things are going to be different. Things are going to be different. First game, things are not that different. Um, Russell Wilson does whatever he wants to that defense. They lose by double digits in that game. But then, you know, it's second week. They come out. They're, that means the Cowboys. Um, not sure how good the Cowboys are. I'm still not really certain about that. Um, even after three weeks, I still don't. I mean, we know the offense is good, but, like, as a team, not really sure how good they're going to be. They just know that we just know they're in a bad division. Um, so, first, second week, you come out. And you're looking great. First half, you're looking great. Third quarter, you're looking great. Fourth quarter, you're looking great. Offense moving up and down the field. Defense is, is relatively handling a very good offense. And then it all implodes. Which, again, for a Falcons fan or anyone who's watched the Falcons, whether, again, as a casual fan of the, the sport or of, or as a diehard fan of the Falcons, if they have any of those left, um, you knew it was, it was not surprising, I guess, like I said um, last week. If it was any other team but the Falcons, I'd be like, "Wow, this is this is wild." Because it was the Falcons, I'm like, "You know what? I this isn't even that surprising." Like, I could not say that it's not like this kind of thing happens often because it doesn't, unless it's the Falcons. Um, but it is one of those situations where I was like, "You know what? This is a very Falcons thing to have happen." After you lose twenty eight to three, after you lose a Super Bowl where you up twenty eight to three, like anything after that is like, uh, "Yeah, this could probably happen to the Falcons." So then it did. You're like, all right, they did the whole onside kick thing. Everything goes wrong. All right, cool. How do you bounce back from that? And they bounce back by doing the exact same thing to a worse offense the following week. So this week, they are up 
Let me let me double check here. I think they were up twenty six to ten, which I believe they might have also been up in the last game um, against the Cowboys, but just obviously different times in the game. But I'm trying to let me see where's this where's this game at. Um, as like I said, I just want to make sure I got this right. Well, they ended up with twenty six points, so it's very plausible that they were up twenty six ten. Um, let me see. Okay, so by the in the third quarter, well, I guess can go into the fourth because the Bears in score. Um, after Jimmy Graham touched down, like late in the se- in the second quarter, they didn't score again until the fourth. So by like end of the beginning of the fourth quarter, they're up twenty six ten. Um, Nick Foles hasn't really done a whole lot because um, they they did bench him for Mitch. Um, it looks like the Mitch Trubisky era in Chicago is over, barring some sort of injury to Nick Foles. Knock on wood. Um, and it was just one of those situations where like, all right, they're two and zero. Like he had played. All right for a quarter against the Lions, and like against the Giants, he didn't look that bad. But it's also like the Giants. Um, like I said, then that's not really a good barometer. Um, but then he was played like not really that great in the first half, and obviously he had the had a really bad interception. And then Matt Nagy was like, you know what? That's enough. We got to go in a different direction. And like, hey, I get it. It's a good team. You think this team can be good? You think this team can be something? And if you think that, then you're not gonna. You don't want your team to be held back by the quarterback for two years in a row. That's basically what was held back by last year. They went 8-8 eight and eight with average to below average quarterback play. And if they had just gotten slightly better quarterback play, or like just average quarterback play, because again, I, I would argue it wasn't even average last year from Mitch and then Chase Daniel. Um, if they just even got average, if things might have worked out better for them, they might have maybe snuck into the playoffs. So then, then this year, Matt Nagy's like, you know, we're not going to have that happen again. So that's why they brought Nick Foles just in case. We're going to give Mitch the the beginning of the season, try to see where he's at. But at some point, you knew he was probably going to get benched because he's Mitch Trubisky and he doesn't, he's not really that good. Um, so you knew it was going to happen. And then it did happen. So Nick Foles comes in. He's got hooks off a little shaky, but he ends the game 16-29, 188 yards, three touchdowns, one reception, and the Falcons lose. Again, up 26-10, and they lose again. And it's not. And this one was more on Matt Ryan because Matt Ryan was also not good in that game. And he had the he had to pick a bad pick late there, obviously to seal it. He missed uh, I think when they were up twenty six to twenty three. Yeah, after the the second Bears touchdown, I think he had a deep pass that the guy was open, just missed. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those things where this is an indictment on coaching when you can't hold leads as a team offensively, or like offensively you just kind of your offense just kind of goes in the tank, and then defensively you can't get stops late in games to, again, hold double-digit leads. Like, 16 points, that's three score. Well, technically, it's a two-score lead. But it took the Bears three scores to to beat you. Because on the first score, um, they 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 weren't able to get the two-point conversion. So they were down 26-10. 26-16, excuse me. After the Jimmy Graham touchdown with, like, six minutes left. And that's the, that's the craziest part about this. All this happens in, like, such a short amount of time. It's not like... They build a lead. Like, it's not like they scored a little bit in the third and scored a little bit in the fourth, different things, or they or went to overtime. Like, no. They scored three touchdowns in, like, a four-minute span, 620, 421, and 153. Um, that was the time remaining in the fourth quarter. So, again, like, a four-minute span, they scored three touchdowns to take the lead. And, obviously, it was all, it was all, that was all she wrote for the Falcons. So, like I said, when you blow those kind of leads in back-to-back games, that's an indictment on the coaches. Again, obviously, players got to make plays. They're the ones out there on the field. All that sounds fine and good. But again, for whatever reason, your team is incapable of holding leads. Like, that's an indictment on the coaching. You guys, you guys, for some reason, your players get mentally relaxed or something. I don't know what it is, whether they just, like, take their foot off the gas when they're up big. Like I said, after you blow a lead of that magnitude a week ago, you can't have it happen again. And expect to keep your job. Like, again, you can have it happen because it, it, it clearly did, and it, it happened. But you can't expect to keep your job. And so I imagine um, Dan Quinn, I don't know what more, like, again, if he's not fired, like, this week, because it's three weeks in the season, I don't think he's going to get fired. Um, like I said, they play the Packers next week on Monday night. Like, that's probably a loss. And, again, after their, after their schedule does weaken up, they play the, the Panthers, but that's a division game. Those aren't easy. They play the Vikings, who offensively look look solid. Justin Jefferson had a great game today. But defensively, not that good. They play the Lions, not a not a bad team. They play the Broncos. Um, well, they play the Pants again and the Broncos. So, like I said last last week, they're a team that if they got things right this week and going into next week, maybe they could have had something. 
But now I, I, I'm completely off that train. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't know. Like I said, at this point, Dan Quinn can't keep his job. He can't still be the coach next year. He just can't. Like, he's shown you who he is. And when somebody shows you who, who they are, you should believe them. And like I said, I believe this team under Dan Quinn just is going to, is a team that's going to, week in and week out, <laughs> have a chance to just blow leads. That's just who they are. They're just, I don't call them chokers because that's, like, harsh. But, like, um, if you have a synonym for that, insert it there. That's what they are. And like I said, that's that's what they've been under Dan Quinn's leadership. And it's just that at this point, they need to move on. And like I said, they're kind of stuck because I think they would have the first pick right now if um, the draft for today it's not, obviously. Like I said, they're kind of stuck because it's like Matt Ryan's on a big contract. It's not like they can get out of it that soon. He's like, I think he's, what, 35? So it's not like he's young. Um, but like I said, they have the number one overall pick. Like... Do you like you have to plan for the future? Would you not take Trevor Lawrence? And then if you do take Trevor Lawrence, yeah, he's thirty five. Will be thirty six next March. Um, well, then if you do take Trevor Lawrence, it's like at what point do you move on from Matt Ryan? Because like I said usually the issues hadn't been Matt Ryan; he wasn't that good in this game. But he has what he has currently three more years left on his deal. Their only potential out is in well, their potential out. Is in 2022. So he's there through this year. He's there through next year. Um, so like I said, it's just, I don't really know when they'd be able to get out. Like, like the, the best situation for them would be in 2023 because they only have, if they got rid of him then, they'd only have $8 million in dead cap that year. But like I said, after this season, they have, well, I guess we're going into next season, it'd be $49 million, I think. And going into 2022, it'd be $26 million in dead cap if they'd want to pay that. Um, but like I said, I don't know, and no one's gonna trade for him. He's old. He's old. Like I said, he's a good quarterback, but he's he's older. Like I don't know where who would trade for a contract that big at this time. So like they're kind of stuck with him. But it's like if I'm a new coach, I don't like I like Matt Ryan. I think he'll be fine. But I, I want to have someone I can build and grow with. Like again, Matt Ryan's gonna be 36 by the time a new head coach takes over, whoever he is. Like I said, obviously you have the guys like Drew Brees and Tom Brady that played into their 40s. I'm just like, that's not the norm. Most most quarterbacks don't last that long. So like, they got to figure out something there. So yeah, like I said, Dan Quinn, on the hottest seat. Um, he should be gone. Um, this I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's... Like, if they have another embarrassing performance on Monday night, I think there's a chance he's gone. Um, but again, I don't know how, how short Arthur Blank's leash is going to be after, again, you gave him an extra year when you didn't have to. So we'll see about that. But like I said, the Falcons, I didn't forget about you. Well... Not the Falcons. Dan Quinn, I didn't forget about you. Because Falcons fans, you guys don't deserve this. Um, there's no reason that sports should be this painful. Um, obviously, I know at the, end, at the end of the day, only one team ever won the championship. But there's no reason that sports should put you through some of the things that you get put through as a sports fan in any sport. Like I said, it's not just a football thing, not just a baseball, not just a basketball. Any sport you follow, if you're not like team hopping or like bandwagon jumping, as you want to, or bandwagon riding, if you want to call it that. Like if you support one team... The chance of you not going through a dark period, I guess, unless you're the Lakers, because uh, we'll talk about them in a second and kind of how they're like, oh, we, we went through this all this seven year drought or whatever, or not making the playoffs and like the teams are bad. Like, all right, like, and there are teams that have been perennially bad for like their entire existence as a franchise. Like, the Lakers, like, you guys having to like rebuild for like five years is like, all right, it's not that bad, guys. Um, but yeah, that was funny. Um, but yeah, so just speaking on the positive, because obviously the Dan Quinn guy that's on the hot seat, the guy that's obviously now on the hot seat is Sean McDermott, and neither is Josh Allen. And I know, obviously, Kyler was in that MVP talk. You, everyone had him in there after week two. Obviously, he's going to fall back a little bit to the game he had. But if there, was a gun, if there was going to be a guy to take his place in that MVP ranking, it should very well be Josh Allen. And again, I've been a guy that's been... Josh Allen hater is not the right word, but Josh Allen skeptic because he he hadn't been that accurate as a quarterback at any point in his career in the first two years. And he's still very reckless. He still does things and make decisions that were just like very questionable. And he's like, what are you doing? But this year he's being more efficient. He, again, had through for 300 yards again in this game. Um, I think back that's now back by game 300 yards and three touchdowns, had four touchdowns. In, in total, well, in four touchdowns in this game, and plus had a rushing touchdown, so five touchdowns in total, excuse me. Um, one interception, so not great. Um, took four sacks, but again, he's a guy that's going to hold the ball a lot and try to try to run around, try to make plays, so that's not that surprising. 
But again, he was just in a situation which he he had been. This isn't like a new thing for him because he's he was a guy that had a lot of like game winning drives last year. But this is a situation where the the Bills were up twenty eight to three. They let the Rams come back, come back, come back. They obviously took the lead with like four minutes thirty left, and then and then Josh Allen drove him down the field, and that's exactly what you want from your quarterback. Grant, you don't want to lose a twenty three to twenty three lead, but at the same time. If you're going to, you want to have a quarterback that's going to allow you to come back and put a drop together when you need it most. And that's what they did. And so they hadn't really done a whole lot in the second half. After they went up 23, had an interception, a punt, a fumble, um, which was, okay, the fumble, Josh Allen, the interception was obviously Josh Allen. But then he had a touchdown drive. And like I said, that all gets erased. No one cares about any of that stuff anymore. And again, it's still there, and that's why people that are still... Josh Allen skeptics are still going to be Josh Allen skeptics because the 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 the, the, the screw ups are still there. You're just like the highs are a lot more frequent this year than the lows. Like the lows are still there with the turnovers and different things and some of the decision making. But again, when you're throwing for four touchdowns a game, you're throwing for three touchdowns every game. Again, you can kind of overlook those things. And so you put together a drive, seventy five yard, eleven play touchdown drive, um, not aided. By a very ticky tack, defense pass interference call could have easily let that go. And then obviously we're having a different discussion about how the Bills blew his lead and blah, blah, blah. But um, unfortunately for the Rams, that's not what happened. They called it. Like I said, it was a tough one. I don't know if I would have called it if I'm a ref, but I'm also not a ref. So there is that. So they got that one in the next play. Um, of course, of course, they scored and the Rams scored a touchdown. So, no, not the Rams, the, the Bills scored a touchdown. So again, shouldn't have been in that position. Maybe shouldn't have even won that game due to the pass, um, pass interference call that went against the Rams. But at the end of the day, it goes as a win for the Bills and as a loss for the Rams. And a lot of that reason why it was a win for the Bills was because of Josh Allen. So like I said, you can't take that away from him. You can't make fun of him. You can't try to um, denounce him or diminish his accomplishments. He's been great this year. Like I said, there's nothing really else to say about that. Again, he still turned the ball over with the fumbles. And the interceptions, things like that. He need, still needs to clean that up. But again, he's what he got: ten passing touchdowns through three games, one interception. Um, yes, I think he has like a couple fumbles. So again, that needs to be cleaned up. But again, he's been great. He's been better than most people thought he could be at this point, or thought he was going to be. He was completing seventy percent of his passes heading into today, and then I think it was what twenty four thirty three. So that is a 72% completion percentage. So, again, he's completing a higher percentage of his passes than people thought he was. I mean, he was inaccurate in, in college. He's inaccurate his first two years. I don't know if he's going to keep up. But, again, maybe it, maybe he just turned a corner. Maybe he's a new quarterback. Maybe he took Carson Wentz's powers. I don't know. But, again, he's playing well, and you have to give the Bills credit for that. And if the Bills are getting a quarterback play like this, because they are like, they were 11-5 to last year with average to like above average sometimes quarterback play. If they get good to great quarterback play on a week-in, week-out basis, they're going to be a team to be reckoned with in that AFC, obviously behind the Chiefs and the Ravens. But, again, someone's got to be a three seed. It could be them. Um, so, like I said, the good win for them. Also, in the AFC, like I said, um, Jets, Stink, Adam Gase. I don't think most coaches don't get fired their second year. But, again, the reason why he could just because you've seen no growth from Sam Darnold. Like, obviously, he came in. As a quarterback guru, quarterback whisperer, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, part of that was because he was lucky enough to work with Peyton Manning, who obviously is basically his own quarterback coach, his own offensive coordinator, does everything. But um, there's a chance that if Sam Darn doesn't pick it up because he's been bad this year, three touchdowns, four interceptions, through three interceptions today, including two pick sixes against the Colts, who, I mean, their defense isn't bad, but it's not. It's not like that. Um, obviously, was all right as a rookie, was like okay as a second-year guy. Also, the mono, different things slowed him up a little bit. But, again, he's never really had a season warranting you, you being like, you know what, he's our guy. And like I said, if that doesn't turn around for him, there's no reason to believe that a guy coming in fresh would be like, you know what, I want to tie my 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 um, coaching, not, not legacy, but my coaching uh, tenure here with the Jets to Sam Darnold, especially if they have a high enough pick to draft a Trevor Lawrence, draft a Justin Fields, draft a Trey Lance, or whoever you, whoever this, this coach wants. Assuming it's an offensive guy. I do, don't know if it'll be an offensive guy. 
like I said, there's no guarantee that they'll want to keep Sam Darnold if he doesn't he doesn't improve. Like I said, same thing that happened with Daniel Jones, where like if he just shows little improvement, still making still turning the ball over, still fumbling, still having questionable decision making. If they're in a, if the Giants are in a position to draft a quarterback high, like there's no reason to believe that um, a new regime, assuming Gettleman's out, which he should be, but like Joe Judge didn't draft Sam Donald, Jason Garrett didn't draft Dan- Sam Donald. Like I said they have no ties to him, other than he was already the quarterback there and he was his first year, so they weren't going to pull a Josh Rosen. I guess they didn't want to. But also GM was still there. That's part of the reason why. Like I said, if a new GM is there, he'd be like, you know what? I don't know if the Sam Donald guy's it. And I think Trevor Lawrence could be the next. Joe Montana could be the next Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, whatever you think he could be. If you think if you think that. Like I said, there's no guarantee. But if that's what you think, there's a reason to tie yourself to Daniel Jones. So that'll be interesting to kind of see how that plays out. Um, but yeah, like I said, Adam gets on a hot seat um, three years into his, three games into his second year with the Jets. And I'd be surprised if he doesn't make it out. Especially, like I said, if the team thinks, which just looks like they're going to, and Sam Donald doesn't improve, then you got to... You gotta make some tough decisions, and that could be one. Um, also, the Patriots they still look good. Two and one. Rex Burkhead had himself a day. Um, three touchdowns. Obviously, wasn't like he didn't have the most yards on the ground. Didn't have the most yards. Well, he had the most yards with the air, just because again they don't really their passing game is not like that yet. But had like I said, forty nine yards on seven catches, a touchdown on, in the in the re- receiving, and then forty nine yards, two touchdowns on the ground. Um, the defense looked solid, gave Derek Carr fits all game. Um, they sacked him twice. I mean, I don't want to say gave him fits, but they gave a... They, they didn't really, like, allow the the Raiders to get going as much as you would have liked. Um, and like I said, they... they, they and then the, the offense looks good again. They were able to run the ball with relative ease. Ran, ran for over 250 yards today, two touchdowns, and most of it wasn't even Cam like it had been. He had nine catches for 27, but when Tony Michelle gets 100 yards, over 100 yards on nine carries, like I said, Burkhead had 49 yards, J.J. Taylor had 43 yards. Like, the the Patriots going to beat you in different ways every week. That's just how who they are. And, and like I said, they continue to show, like, yeah, no, we're not going anywhere yet. And like I said, their schedule, I mean, the big game for them and the big game for the Bills will be the week six matchup because they play the Broncos next week. They should beat them. And they play the Niners. Could be a good matchup if guys are more healthy for the Niners at that time, but who knows? You know, one that I was like I said, the Bills, that'd be a big one for potentially um, the first crack to see like who the main dog is in the AFC. So if it's, is it still the Patriots or is it the Bills' time to shine? Like I said, we'll see that. Um, and and obviously the for the Raiders, it it knocks them back a little bit because they were two and zero heading into that game, and they play the Bills next week, so that. I play the Bills and Chiefs. Like I said, they want to find. We want to find out who they were over these next three games, next four games. You could argue even next five because they play the they play the Patriots. They lost that one. They play the Bills. They play the Chiefs. They play the Bucks, and then they play the Browns. Depending on how good you think the Browns are. So like I said, we're going to find out a lot more about the Raiders over these next few weeks. First test didn't go so well, but they have another chance to bounce back against the Bills. See how they can do there. And obviously, the big one will be against the Chiefs. Thank you for early first place in the AFC West. On the line. I said it seems like it's going to be two-team races. The, the Broncos, with all their injuries, they're probably done for. And the Chargers, with a rookie quarterback, it's hard to really expect them to be in the race. The least thing, they're going to be competitive. Um, but, like I said, I don't know if they're going to be able to compete with the Chiefs. Obviously, they're not going to be able to compete with the Chiefs. But I don't think they'll be able to keep pace with the Raiders either. So, see how that goes. But, yeah, some interesting, some interesting games, some interesting results. It's been seeing performances, some outstanding performances across the league. Um, it's an interesting one, like I said. I will have said interesting a lot. But um, it's a very good, another very solid week of football. Uh, I think also the Falcons, because uh, of course they did have the first COVID-related game absence from A.J. Terrell, their rookie cornerback. So we'll see how that goes. Because obviously they let everyone else play. So don't know about that. I guess whatever concentration they did determine no one else was at risk, but you hope that's the case because obviously they played a whole game. Um, so you don't want anyone on their team getting it or seeing that they got it throughout this week. And then also for anybody on the Bears, you don't want them getting it either because I'd be pissed if I were a Bears fan. And my team got – and the opposing team got me sick because the, they didn't they, – we didn't follow the right protocols and didn't postpone the game or cancel the game. You're not going to postpone it. Um, 
Unless they both play on like the same bye week, or unless, unless they both have the same bye week or something like that. But you get the point. Um, like I said, we'll see what kind of happens with that. That'll be an interesting thing to monitor this week, along with obviously Dan Quinn's job security. But yeah, good week overall. And um, we obviously get the big one on Monday, Ravens, Chiefs. I mean, one of the best early season matchups you may ever, yeah, I'm not going to say ever see, but like, no, we don't get matchups this good this early where potentially we could be seeing these teams battling for the AFC crown for years and years to come. And we're getting it on a Monday night, national TV stage. So that that's going to be fun. Um, so yeah, should be going definitely tune in for that. But speaking of what could be good, the NBA Finals will be starting this week because both series finished. Like I said, they could on the last podcast. I said, like, there's a chance we might we might be talking about how both series are done. So we'll first start off with the game that happened on Sunday, Celtics Heat. What happened in that game? How the Heat were able to get the job done? Also, where the Celtics go? Because obviously they're young and they're and they think they could be around for a while. But like that's what they say about every team that's young and, and has their chance and doesn't capitalize. So. We'll talk about all that, see how it goes, or after this break. So stay right there. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. SMC podcast. Now, so Miami Heat will be back in the house for the first time since LeBron left 2014. I'm um, funny enough against LeBron's team, which they obviously they mentioned in the post game press conference. I felt, I mean, I, I like really like Spo's answer. Uh, I really like Spo's answer on that question because they were talking about like, oh, like I think it was Rachel Nesco was talking like, oh, like what's going to be like playing at your former like former player, blah blah blah. And obviously, I mean, him and Spo. LeBron and Spo, obviously, they, I imagine they have respect for each other now, but obviously Spo, um, um, LeBron's a little shaky on Spo in the beginning. I know they had their little, the chest bumping incident, and like also there was reports that like, oh, um, LeBron may or may not have tried to get Pat Riley to come back and coach the team, may or may not have tried to get Spo fired, and they started out a little shaking, obviously. As we've seen, it was smart for Pat Riley to stick by him because he won two championships. And also, he's been a good head coach since then. Got back to the finals without LeBron, which, again, is always an impressive feat when you can do it without a... I don't... I mean, that's the, that's the question, is like, is, like, how good is Jimmy Butler? Um, but like I say, without a top... A consensus top 10 player. Because, again, Jimmy Butler might be top 10, especially after his playoff run, depending on who you ask. Because, obviously, the last year's playoff run got people... To believe that Kawhi was the best player in the world, which I was never really fully on that train. I mean, he's not better than KD, regardless, whenever they're healthy. Um, so that was already foolish. But also, KD wasn't healthy. She just says that. But like, I don't know if I'd have him over LeBron. I don't know if I'd have him over Steph. Different things, but that's a separate point. So like I said, I don't know. If, like Jimmy Buzz in that 10 to 15 range, like probably the 8 to 15 range, where it's like after a certain after a certain player, you just kind of just like everybody, just like they're all similar level. So that you could, depending on what you want or how you feel, you're going to pick a different guy. Like I said, it's always impressive when you can get to the finals without that, like, superstar guy. Or even, like, a second superstar. Like, again, Bam's an all-star. But he's not at that level yet. He can be. And he shows potential in this game six, as we'll get to. But, again, the, this is obviously the most impressive finals run for Spo, who now has five trips to the finals. We'll see how this one plays out. Because, again... 
I, I do believe that the Lakers probably have a bit more, but we'll talk about that on, t- on no, I guess you'll, well, you guys will hear it on Wednesday as we preview that final, of the finals, give my predictions, all that stuff, um, before game one on Wednesday. But yeah, so the Heat, we were able to get the job done. And it was an interesting, it was a back and forth kind of game. Um, the, they said the Celtics, as I knew, they weren't going to go away on Friday, and then they also weren't going to go away today because they're, they're a very solid team. So, I expected nothing less. The Heat came out hot, though, in the first half. I mean, the first quarter, scored 33. Then the Celtics responded, scored 33 of their own. So, it was a two-point game at halftime. Third quarter played even. And then the Celtics went on there and had themselves a little run. Also, I think, especially in that first half, they were aided by Marcus Smart. I believe he had, like, four threes in the first quarter. Though, he only had four for the game, so that was, like, part of the issue. Um, But, I believe he had four threes in the first quarter. So, not that offense keeps pace as Tatum was struggling again. He didn't have a field goal into the second quarter. Had a bunch of assists though, but he didn't have a, 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 a not traditional, but like an actual field goal in, until into the second quarter. Which again, a slow start for him. He got it back together, but then obviously later in the game couldn't get it done. But that's one so no one on the Celtics get it done. We'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, but overall, Bam it was a great start to finish at thirty two on an eleven to fifteen shooting, fourteen rebounds, five assists. Um, just again, he's he's arguably their most important player. Again, a lot of people say Jimmy Butler, and I do get that because he's the de facto leader. He's um, the most prominent player, the biggest name, um, the most accolades, things like that. But again, in terms of what their team is able to do, and like the unlocking their potential, a lot of it is because of Bam. Obviously, it's a lot of it's because of Jimmy Butler, too. But a lot of that is because of Bam and what he can do on the offensive end and defensive end. Again, he can be a guy that can protect the rim. He can defend on the wing. Again, I'm not going to say he's going to shut down, like, LeBron or he's going to shut down, like, I don't Well, I guess they really don't have, the Lakers don't have guards like that. Like, I'm not going to say he's going to be guarding Rondo or anybody like that every, every time down, things like that nature. But he can when he switched on to them. And also on the offense, I mean, in the second half, they literally had him running point. Like, just him getting, especially in that fourth quarter, they just he would just either grab the rebound, dribble the ball up, or get or get or get inbounded the ball and dribble the ball up as as a center. He was their point guard. Like I said, obviously they they prepared for that with Jokic, so it's not going to be a new um, phenomenon for the Lakers. Um, but still, it's just like having guys like that can make your offensive, and especially when once he can do it on defensive end as well, because that's the thing with Jokic, he's not really the greatest defensive player. And I mean, he's not terrible, but you put him in pick and roll, you normally can you normally can figure some things out on how to score on him. Uh, but yeah, like he's like the things he can do on both ends of the floor. Obviously, he had the great block on on Tatum in game one. So so he's, again, he has those high moments on offense and defense, and, then th- and he was able to put it all together today with the with the 32 and 14 performance. Though he... he he didn't even have, like, the, the Duncan Robinson and Iggy had the best plus minuses on the team. So that's kind of funny. But his plus minus was zero. But, again, obviously he had the biggest statistical performance on the team. And he really was great in that second in that second half in the fourth quarter. It's kind of just going at Tice because Tice was – he couldn't handle him. And I said Grant Williams is too little. Like, they just didn't have a guy on the Celtics. And that's, and that's what we'll talk about in a second. Just That's kind of what their issue is. They don't really have a big guy that can be trusted – in that ilk, because again, Tyus, for as good as he is, as like a as a big guy, as a small ball center, things like that, he's just too small. Like I said, he's like six eight. He was in foul trouble most of the series. Um, and like I said, when they when they their best lineup is probably going even smaller with Tatum at the five, and inserting like Gordon Hayward, kind of things like that. So like I said, they don't have a traditional big, and yeah, not that Bam out of bio is a traditional big, but He's bigger. He's six nine. Um, he's I mean, I was not gonna say he's stronger, but he weighs more. Or at least according to ESPN, he has about a ten pound um, difference on Tice. So again, just that 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 size made a difference. But then also they got big play from Miggy. Like I said, he hit five. Well, no, he hit four threes. It was five five from the field. That's the thing about having vets on your team. Yet every once in a while, those vets have themselves a good game. Especially shooting the ball. Like I said, we've seen it from playoff Rondo. You, I expect to see it from Dane Green at least once or twice in the finals. Like, 
though like those experienced guys that have been in this moment before, every once in a while they just have that moment where it all kind of it all kind of go they they I don't want to say go back in time, but like it just like that they just like it just I don't say even click isn't the right word, but just like they just snap into like an a younger version of themselves and they they just play great and like I said that's what then that's what they got from Mickey and because again Tyler here off their bench didn't really do a whole lot until the second half specifically especially in that fourth fourth quarter he was great there as well as he has been in other games in the series but he did a lot of scoring for them especially in that third and helping to continue to build that lead um like I said he hit the four threes which again he's not a three-point shooter anymore he's there's not really that's not really his game but on the heat you have to be able to shoot if you're going to be out there playing and he was and like I said, he was great. Um, in the playoffs, he's hitting like about 36% of his threes, which is not bad, but especially it's good for him because if he's going to be out there, you got you got to at least be able to respect him and respect his shot, and that's what they can do now if he's going to be hitting um, 36 37% of his threes. Like, you can't just leave him open because he can knock it down. And as we showed in this game, the ones he can hit, and the ones he did hit were big. Duncan Robinson hit five threes. He only hit one three but had 19 points off the bench and seven assists plus five rebounds. And the five turnovers was struggling there a little bit early in the fourth when the Celtics went on their run and got up big. But then the Celtics got tight, in my personal opinion. Because they took they took a... What was it? They took a one... No, no, they took a... No, okay, so they, they took a lead. I know that, yeah, they took 198 lead. That's trying to, I was trying to find it. Early in the, like, midway through the fourth. Then Bam tied it up. And with the and one. Wait, no. This is this is backwards. No, ESPN's, the ESPN app, excuse me. But yeah. Um, then Bam was, like, going back and forth. They were going back and forth a little bit. And they hit the 102. So, Jimmy Butler gives them a three-point lead. Jason Tatum cuts it to a one-point lead. Then they had 102 points at 540 in the fourth, right? They did not score again until Jalen Brown free throws at 219. Meanwhile, in that time, the Celtics, I mean, not the Celtics, the Heat had taken their their score. For, they were at 103. By the time the Celtics scored again, they were at 116. And I said, Jimmy Butler was scoring. Uh, Tiro was scoring. Iggy made a free throw. Duncan Robson hit a big three to put them up five. Like I said, they were just getting contributions from a little bit from everybody. And the Celtics just got cold at the wrong time. I said, it's a one-point game. And they just started missing shot after shot after shot. And I think the issue is that they got a little, especially once they started, once the Heat started building their lead up, getting it to three and five and seven and like that, like they started getting three happy. Cause they're like, oh, we need to get back in. We need to get back in. And obviously they're a team that shoots three. So it's not like, it's not like it was out of the norm for them. But just like one of those things where you kind of press. The same thing happens with like the Rockets and teams like that. When you're a jump shooting team and you're just like, oh, we need a big shot. We need a big shot to get us back in it. Then you get a little three-point happy instead of being getting more high-percentage shots, even though obviously open threes for good shooters are high-percentage shots, but you get the point. Um, you get a little three happy, and the next thing you know, you're out there bricking shot after shot after shot while the the Heat were getting, like I said, they were getting threes, they were getting free throws, they were getting twos, like they were getting a little, they were getting it all, all over the place. And like I said, by the time the Celtics started getting shots again, or making shots again, it was it was all but too late. And that's the thing. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna be all three happy, and or not, if you're gonna be three happy. But if you're gonna be missing shots on one, then you got at least got a D up, and they weren't even D up late in that fourth quarter. And that's kind of what did them in was the fact that they weren't able to defend well enough to 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 be able to keep themselves close while they were continuing to miss shots, or until they were able to start hitting shots again. So, by, but so by the time they started hitting shots or getting free throws or whatever, it didn't matter. And the game was basically out of reach. Like I said they were down fourteen with um with like two minutes left. Like I said, I think the official run for like up until they started they scored again was like twenty six to six the heat went on. So again that's a twenty point swing year you they were up I guess they were what up six? Yeah, they were up ninety six ninety. And then like I said, they by the next time they scored it was one 16-102. And I said, that was the game. When they went up six, and the Heat weren't playing that well, and I was like, ooh, this is bad. And the Celtics might 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 um, uh, might have something here. They might be able to force a game seven. 
And that was when Tyler Hero stepped up, hit a big three, and hit a big uh, pull-up jumper to, to tie the game after Jimmy Butler hit a free throw. And then um, and then that's when I said that's when Bam started started getting going. That's when Jimmy started getting going. Duncan Robinson, like I said, hit the big three. They were getting contributions from everyone. But Tyler Hero was big in that stretch to kind of, once they got down six and it was like, ooh, this might get away from them, he hit some big shots, and that's what sh- good shooters can do. They can hit big shots. And they can make tough shots. Obviously, the one three was wide open, but the pull up shot was 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 nice. Um, and then next thing you know, boom! Like I said, you're right back in it. If you go from down six, losing all the momentum, if you believe in that, and next thing you know, like you're tied, and then now you're now you're now that you start seeing shots go in, that you're on you're rolling. That's exactly what happened with Heat. So, yeah, it's um good win. Obviously, they've been impressive all bubble, all postseason. So it makes sense. It's only right that they got to the finals, but from a Celtics perspective, where do they go from here? And now everyone's saying like, oh, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, they're so young, they're so young, they'll be back, they'll be back, and again, that's what they said two years ago when they got to the Eastern Conference Finals and lost to LeBron in Game 7. They're like, oh, they'll be back, they'll be fine. Then the next year, they were not in fact fine. They, they, I think they lost in the first round to the Bucks, if I remember correctly, um, but that was like the Kyrie situation, that was a whole mess. Then after this year, they get back to the Eastern Conference Finals and lose again. And as a person... Other Sevens podcast that is a Thunder fan. I know everything's like about being a young, up and coming team that everyone's like, oh, they're only 23 and 24, only 23 and 22. Like, they'll be around forever. Like, they'll have all these opportunities, blah, blah, blah. But they haven't been, the Celtics of the franchise haven't been to the finals since 2010, just like the Lakers. The Lakers didn't have the luxury of being on the benefiting, or the, uh, I guess, the beneficiary of one of the worst trades in NBA history and all sports history with the like Paul Pierce KG trade where they had all those picks from the Nets when they were bad and obviously they were able to get good players they were able to get Jalen Brown able to get Jason Tatum like they were able to get good players from that trade but the Lakers were able to rebuild um, differently and they got back to the finals before then obviously it helps that they had LeBron if the Celtics had LeBron obviously they would have got to the finals but you get the point um, and I said you, you, it's hard to look at the, what the Lakers did and be like, oh yeah, the Celtics are going to be fine. Because again, the Lakers did it differently and did it a much more unconventional, well not unconventional, but a much harder path. They have to get free agents, they have to, they have to trade for AD, which I mean the Celtics could have did but didn't want to. They could have traded for PG, they could have traded for Kawhi. The guys didn't want to give up Tatum and Brown. Cool, I respect that. They, they were both great in the playoffs. But at the same time, it's like don't just assume they'll be back. Like, take advantage of every opportunity. So I'm going to say the same thing for... I'll talk about the Nuggets with this in, in the next um, segment. But don't just assume they'll be back. It is not that easy. It's not, especially when next year, KD and Kyrie are going to be playing. Assuming KD is even 80% of what he was, that's still better than at least everybody, but just hit him on the Celtics. Um, Kyrie's still going to be Kyrie, still going to be scoring, stuff like that. But they'll be back. Um, we'll see about we'll see about the the Bucks, um, the Raptors. We'll see about them. The Heat aren't going anywhere, outside of Jimmy, and well, outside of like outside of Iggy, like really, like most of their guys should be back. And obviously, they'll have ex- finals experience and all the different experience and things like that. And again, we'll see what happens outside the bubble, as opposed to in the bubble. But again, the, their, that team's going to be around. Um, the Sixers maybe they'll be better with better coaching, or will. Ty Lucas. I don't know how they're going to be with D'Antoni. I wouldn't fear them too, too much with D'Antoni. Um, but I said, it's just, if there's no, you don't, and also you don't know. Like, no one thought that he were going to be this good outside of Miami Heat fans. Coming to this year, everyone thought like, oh, because you went down there, they didn't make the playoffs last year. Obviously, they had Bam. Everyone thought Hero was a reach. I didn't, as I've said. No one really knew about Duncan Robinson. No one knew about Kendrick Nunn. Um, they were able to trade for Jay Crowder and Iggy midseason, which obviously helped them out a lot. Um, I said even Bam, people who thought he could be good, but he obviously took his game to another level this year. I said, yes, like, you don't know what's the future holds. And also, like I said, Celtics, outside of Gordon Hayward, and haven't had any real injuries. And so they've been lucky in that regard. Like, again, Jalen Brown's been healthy. Um, Tatum was healthy. Kemba was, I mean, he was in and out of the lineup, but he was he was healthy for the playoffs. Marcus Smart was healthy. Different things like that. Like, you can't just assume that you're always going to be. Like I said, everyone thought the Thunder. I thought the Thunder were going to make it back to two, three, maybe even, well, I mean, maybe not four, but two or three more finals. 
They never made it back. They never made it past the Warriors Conference Finals again. And like I said, the Celtics haven't even gotten that far yet. They haven't even got to the Finals yet. They still got to get there. So like I said, we're talking about like, oh, they'll be good for the next five, ten years, whatever. It's not that simple. It's really not. And as a mind you, this was the same team, same franchise where people were talking about, oh, would you rather take any player or Brad Stevens? And obviously that was a lie because um, you would not take Brad Stevens over LeBron. You would not take him over Anthony Davis. You would not take him over Kevin Durant. Maybe probably not even Kawhi. Like, again, there's a lot of players. Steph, you're not like, come on. That was a foolish question when they asked it. And it's even more foolish now because he's been consistently outcoached in the playoffs outside of against the Sixers where he did that first, like, wall defense that, that um, they've used against Ben Simmons and also teams have adapted to use against Giannis for similar reasons. Um but yeah, I mean, like he's been out coached in the playoffs multiple times. And again, the team had issues even later in later in that game with the zone. And again, the they the Heat were playing good defense with their zone. They were switching, everybody was moving, everybody knew where they needed to go. But it's still it's nothing new. Like you you had seen the zone <laughs> in the last series against the Raptors, and you saw the zone again in this series with the Heat, and they still couldn't consistently beat it when they have good players, good shooters good um, ISO players, like, you should be able to beat a zone, you would think, at a professional level, but hey, it is what it is, but yeah, so I'm just saying to Celtics fans, don't just assume they'll be back, it's easy to say that, like, oh, they'll be back, they'll be fine, but also, I mean, like, it's just not that simple, and also, in this series, like, you gotta figure out what, what are you gonna do after, well, it gets in the offseason, what are you gonna do with Gordon Hayward, because again, he's good for you when he's healthy. He's not the player as he was before the ankle injury. That's That much is clear. And like I said, he's good when he's healthy. But he has injury issues. Like, that's a fair argument against him. Kemba, he was bad. I mean, not, I don't want to say bad. He wasn't, like, terrible. But he wasn't who you you paid max money to in the playoffs. Like, that's not who you... No, that's not who you thought you were getting. You thought you were getting a better version of that. And he was, like, inconsistent in the playoffs. Kind of thing. Um, Jason Tatum is going to be up for an extension, I believe. And obviously, he's the guy they're going to build around, try to figure out what they can do with him. But like I said, you, in order to get back to finals, um, you're going to need more. And you know, we need more consistency from him. Like I said, he had the one game in Game Four where he didn't score until the second half, and that can't happen for your best player. You had a game today where he didn't score in the first quarter. That can't happen with your best player. Like he was nine twenty six in this game. Like that 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 can't ha- like your best players need to play their best, like to play their best consistently in the playoffs. And if they don't, you're probably gonna lose. So I said he's gonna need to get more consistent. Again, he's a young guy. He's only what twenty two years old. Just turned twenty two in March. So like I said they'll be fine in general. But I believe what this is his this is his third season. So he's eligible for the extension. I believe. Yeah, he should be eligible for his extension. So he's gonna get paid this summer. Jalen Brown's already got his money. If I remember correctly. So it's not like this team is going to get any cheaper. And like I said, that's going to make it difficult to build a team around him. And like I said, then they got like one year left on Gordon Hayward's deal with assuming he opt in, which I mean, why would he not opt in? Um, they gave like, again, they gave Jalen Brown the four year, $115 million extension. They gave Kemba a big extension. No, well, they signed him to a big deal or whatever, the sign and trade thing, however that worked out. But you get the point. Like I said, it's not going to be as simple. They need to get. You need to get better bench. Like I said, Gordon Hayward is fine off the bench, and then, like that's good. But like, they need to get someone else. Like whether again, I don't know if it's um, hoping for improvement from Wanamaker, reporting hoping for improvement from the two Williams guys, Robert Williams or Grant Williams. Um, I don't know what you do with Tice. I don't know what you do with Canner. Like I said, you need probably a better backup big in the playoffs. Because like I said, Canner is unplayable in certain series. And like I said, I don't know if you're going to replace him with Williams or whoever. You got to you got to beef up the bench. And also, I get a little bit more size. Like I said, I understand like them wanting to go small, but as we saw in the in the Rockets Lakers series, if they have a big like Anthony Davis or like a Bam or that that can go small and still then then them not be that small, then that that negates you being able to go small. Like I said, obviously, the Celtics try to go small, but, like, whether it's Grant Williams in or Gordon Hayward in with their their four main guys, like, all right, you can go small, but, like, again, if Bam is still in there being able to protect the paint, what does it matter? Or he's going to be able to guard, not, like, again, exclusively, but guard a Tatum or a Brown or Gordon Hayward on the wing 
or a Kemba. Like, it, what's like what's the point of going small? Like, again, you lose your advantage. So, like I said, they probably need to get someone else big because, again, the issue with Tice is that he just couldn't stay on the floor. He was always in foul trouble. And, again, some of them were ticky-tack and different things. Maybe he hasn't warranted the reputation to get some of those calls. But, like I said, you're going to need somebody that can stand in there and, and be able to handle handle that. Like you saw um, with the... With the Lakers, I mean, actually, no, we'll touch on that in a second, so we'll talk about that. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're going to need more someone else. Like I said, Tice is a solid, fine center. I don't know if, like, but you need somebody else with some size when it comes to the playoffs. You need somebody else, so you can't just go small all the time and, consist- and expect to, like, get there. Unless you have, like I said, unless you have an Anthony Davis or you have a Bam or somebody like that where they can do the things, or a Jokic, where you can do the things as a guard from the center position. That's not who Tice is. That's not who um, Kanner is. They're just they're just centers, and Tice just happens to be shorter than most traditional centers. So, like I said, um, it worked for them. They got this far, so I'm not going to say I had to completely throw away the plan. But they need to get a better bench. They're going to need to, like I said, probably add a better backup big if you if you're going to have faith faith in Tice or whether that you hope that's Robert Williams or whoever. Um, and also, you're going to need to, like I said, I'm not saying Brad Stevens needs to get fired or anything like that, but maybe the conference finals is, is his ceiling. Like I said, maybe that's, that, maybe that's the best he's going to get. Maybe he's like a good, very seasoned coach and a fine playoff coach that's just never going to get you over the hump. And that's what I think you need to evaluate this offseason is that do you think Brad Stevens can win you a championship? Like I said, a lot of people do believe that. I'm not saying I don't believe that because, again, if Tatum plays better or or Brown, or, or Kemba is more consistent, like, maybe they do win this series. And I said, it's a fair thing to wonder, like, because they've gotten this far before. Like, can like can they get over the hump? At some point, you got to get over the hump. I said, is Brad Stevens that guy? Like I said, they, that's a decision. I, they'll probably keep him around, but I think that's the fair question to ask. Is Brad Stevens the guy to get you over that hump? So they have to make a bunch of tough decisions this offseason. They have to figure all that stuff out. Um, so, yeah, we'll kind of see how it goes with them. Like I said, good season. He were just a better team at the end of the day. In the, in the bubble, like I said. Outside of the bubble, who knows? But in the bubble, they were the better team. They deserved to win. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, did the Heat win or did the Salty show? It's like, no, the Heat won this series. Point blank period. They were the better team. So be it. It happens. Sometimes, again, sometimes you, out, you just get outplayed. It is what it is. But yeah, we'll kind of see what is next for Celtics and how they try to build this team around Tatum, again, because obviously he's the main centerpiece. Kemba, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart, all those kind of guys are just like auxiliary, not auxiliary pieces, but like complementary pieces. But Jason Tatum is the piece, and you want to do everything to maximize him and make sure he's getting the best. He's, he's being as consistent as he can be, he's playing as well as he can play, and you make sure he has the piece around him to make sure that your team can have that deep postseason run and get back to the finals for the first time since 2010. I said you're a bit rival, re- rebuilt, just like you rebuilt and got back to the finals before you. So, got to figure out a way to finally get over that hump. So, see what happens in the coming years. But after this break, we'll come back and discuss the West Conference Finals. Obviously, as you know by now, the Heat, the Lakers, were able to get it done. So, we'll talk about that, how they were able to do it, and also what's next for the Nuggets. Because, again, they're another young team that's like, oh, they'll be back, they'll be back, they'll be back kind of thing. But it's a different scenario with them. In my personal opinion. But again, we'll talk about all that stuff right after the break. So stay right there. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info.
Pod and the Drinking Pod, GSMC Podcast Network. So, as you saw on Saturday night, the Lakers were able to finish out the Nuggets, 117-107, get their first trip to the finals since, like I said, 2010, um, and their first year back in the playoffs in like seven years. Um, this is now the 10th time LeBron's been to the finals. Quite impressive in his 17-year career. He's made the finals more times than he's missed. Um, so, again, that's impressive. Um, he's made it nine of the last ten years. Because, again, he went like yeah, it was the eight in a row. And then, obviously, he didn't make it last year because of the injury. And I, I, that team wasn't good enough to make the finals, I don't think. But, again, I the, the 2018 team should not have made the finals either. If, it, if they didn't have LeBron, they literally um, they wouldn't have even made the playoffs. But they had LeBron, and that's all that matters. Obviously, this year is a little bit different. They this this team had Anthony Davis. Like you could argue, he was their best player, and he is their best player on some nights. Um, but in this game, when they needed him, to LeBron was that guy. And like I said, LeBron is still even in year seventeen at thirty five years old. Everyone like he can summon that best player in in the world ability. Like I said, sometimes does Anthony Davis have his nights? Some days he has his own, but in this game, he had 38 points, 16 rebounds, 10 assists, 15 and 25 shooting. Um, and this, it was great in every aspect of the game. Plus, obviously, his defense against Jamal Murray in game four was a part of the reason why they were able to get that, that W in that game. So, like I said, he was just great all around. So, yeah, he had a great game. Anthony Davis, again, still doing Anthony Davis things, 25-7. Not seven, excuse me, five. I don't know why I got seven from. Um, 27 and five, three assists, two steals. Still doing the typical Anthony Davis things. So that was nice for him. They were also able to get some contributions from Danny Green. He had 11 points, the only other player in double figures. But they're going to need him in the... Well, take it back, Cruz was in double figures as well. He had 11. But they're going to need him in the finals. Because again, he's a guy that's experienced. He's been there before. Has a championship experience just last year. And obviously he has previous experience with the Spurs. But again, when he's hitting shots, their offense is more open. Because they're not a great three-point shooting team. Obviously, they were 9 of 24 in this game, which is 37%. But again, they're not they're not going to be the Heat. The Heat darn near shot like 50% from three. It was something like that in this game. Uh let me let me double check. They shot 48%. 13 to 27. So again, and shot 56% from the field. So I mean they were just great all around. But I said, that's not them. Their, their team is going to beat you with defense, beat you with, like, like sound, like, like sound fundamentals. Like, again, they're not really going to, they're not really going to mess up rotations. They're not really going to screw up on switches, things like that. I mean, everybody messes up. Everybody misses assignments, different things like that. But they're going to usually be very, very locked in into and not going to make too many mental mistakes, things of that nature. And then, like I said, they're also going to play tough defense, which, again, the Heat do as well. But, Again, they don't have the three-point volume that the the Lakers don't have the Heat have. So they're gonna have, they have to win in other ways. And then also they they also happen to have two of the five best players in the world on their team, which at the end of the day does help you a lot, especially when you get into the playoffs. Um, like I said, sometimes it's just all that matters is just having the best player. Honestly, it didn't matter in the Celtics series because you could argue that the Celtics had the best player in Jason Tatum. I mean, you could argue. Um, you, you you would argue probably like three of the five best players, you would argue, on a given night, were on the Celtics. But again, when your others are so much better than their others, that's that's what matters. So again, this will be, obviously I expect like LeBron to outplay Jimmy Butler. As you know, like I said, I won't get into that. We'll talk about that in the preview. But yeah, in this game, they played great. The Nuggets, I think at, on their end, they just ran out of gas at the end of the day. I mean, they've been playing... I think it was like uh, J- Jamal Murray was like number one in minutes by like a lot. Um, I think Jokic was like two or three. So they they played a lot. They played game sevens in both previous series. And then again, this isn't like a normal. Obviously, there's less travel, so you're not tired in that aspect. But like you're playing every other night. It's just a lot of energy, especially with Jamal. He's gonna have to. He was having to score in the first round. Had to score forty, fifty points. Did it in the last series as well. So he's like that's that. He's he's exerting a lot of energy. Um, on the offensive end, and like I said, while playing a lot of minutes, playing, playing in the forties every night. And even in this game, he played forty-three minutes. Again, he's then 
have it going offensively as much as you would like. 7 to 17. Hit no threes. Had 19 and 8. But also had 5 turnovers. So that hurt. Jokic was once again in foul trouble. And that's what he's going to need to work on, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, he struggled with with the size of the Lakers, with the white, the like. Um, and again, it's not like he was like, it's not like he was like getting in foul trouble because of that, but like he was just letting it affect him. And then now he's he's making bad fouls on the other end, on the defensive end, when he doesn't have to. And like I said, that's hurting the team because now he's on the bench for extended periods of time. He hadn't played Mason Plumlee a lot of minutes. Um, he played what eighteen, which is probably a lot more than he you would have liked to play Mason Plumlee in a in a closeout game. Potentially. Well, let me just check back for Mason Plumlee's stats for the playoffs. Oh, yeah, for the postseason, up, he was averaging like 11 minutes per game. And in the last two games, he had to play 14 and 18. And obviously, he played 21 in, in the game one. But um, that was prob- partly probably because um, the, the that game, they lost by 12. So it wasn't really that close there at the end. But in, in game two, in the very close game, he played nine. And in game three of the game that they won, he played five. So, again, he's not a guy that you want to have out there if you don't have to have him out there. Other than, like, a quick spell for Jokic. But, again, with Jokic in foul trouble, he had to play more extended minutes. And also, he wasn't the only one. I thought Paul Millsap was in a little bit of foul trouble. At least in the first half. I could be wrong about that. Maybe that was game four. I'm thinking of. Um, but, yeah, just like, he had to, but Jokic needs to, that's something he's going to need to work on. I had a good game, relatively speaking. 20 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, 3 steals. So, again, not a Jokic game, but... A solid game all around. Jeremy Grant still did the best he could at another 20-point outing. But on 7 of 18, uh, 2 of 8 from 3, he's never... He's not that he's a bad player or a bad offensive player by any stretch, but he never should be the guy leading your team in free goal attempts. Unless, like, again, guys are out. That's just not where the offense is. He's not that kind of shooter. He's not that kind of score. Like I said, obviously he had 20 points, but on 18 shots, it's not really... He's not the most efficient player. And plus, like I said, only hit 2 of his 8 threes. So... Um, and then plus he's, he's having his, a lot of injuries guarding LeBron, he's guarding AD. Um, so again, he's doing his part, doing what he can, but again, that's him needing him to score 20 points a night for you to win a game is not really what you want, especially like I said, when you're playing, having to play tough defense on the other end on <laughs> two of the best players in the world. Um, but yeah, the Lakers, like I said, were able to just get it done behind an excellent performance from LeBron and AD, which, again, is what they've been doing for most of the playoffs. Obviously, you sprinkled in good players from, from like, the good good games from, like, Caruso or Rondo or Morris or Green or or whoever. Like I said, they, they everybody else did their part, but at the end of the day, Anthony Davis and LeBron are the reason why they were able to get through the Western Conference, Western Conference playoffs in 15 games. Like, again, no series went past five. Well, the first two series, they won't, they lost the first one and then won four straight. This one, they let... I mean, I don't say they let, but they were able to win game three and then win the first two and the last two. Though, again, if they lose game two, I think this series does go a little bit differently, obviously, because they would have lost game two. But, um, like I said, I don't know if that series goes five, because that, like, I still think the Nuggets could have had two, and I think that was, that was their two. Like I said, when you're the worst team, you need to win the game you're supposed to win. And that was the game they were they should have won, and like I said, they could have won if they just played better defense on the Anthony Davis shot. But once you saw him that open, you knew it was going in. Um, so that was a tough one to lose. And obviously, they were able to bounce back in Game Three. But again, you knew you knew Jamal Murray, Jokic, they were gonna have a good offensive performance one of the game. So you knew they were gonna get them. That was gonna get them one. They needed to sneak another one at least to make it go six. And Game Two was their shot. Unfortunately, they weren't able to get it. Um, but yeah, you know it happens. But um, but yeah, so like I said, we'll talk about more about the Lakers and their and their series against the Heat on the next episode as we preview the finals. But from a Nuggets perspective, they're like I said, they're in the same situation as the Celtics. They they guys are a little bit older, but similar situation where it's like, oh, they're young, they are young, they'll be back. And I get that sentiment, and I don't disagree necessarily. Like they were the two seed last year, they were the three seed this year. They've been a very Solid team the last few years made it one round further every year, if I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. Like I said, they made the conference finals last year. They made it to the semifinals last um No, made the conference finals this year, excuse me. Made the semifinals last year. Made, made it to the first round the year before. But up until this series, they every game, every series they had gone in had gone seven games. So they they they, they were always a tough out. They were always a team that like was going to give it their all, was, was going to make adjustments, was going to do things. 
I wasn't just going to lie down. And again, even in this series, they didn't lie down. I think just ran out of gas. Because again, you're playing all these games for a short amount of time. Eventually, you just run out of gas. And I think that's what happened. They went up against a team that was that definitely was better than them. Um, and they just ran out of gas. And like I said, they weren't playing a Clippers team that's going to let their foot off the gas or kind of just wilt under any sort of comeback attempt. Like, the Lakers aren't that. The, they were able to make comeback attempts on the Lakers, and the Lakers would go on runs of their own to kind of to kind of counteract that. And again, the Jazz the Jazz got up because of great performance from Donovan Mitchell, which he still had throughout the series. But um, the, I, I would argue the Nuggets were better than them without, Bogdan, without Bogdanovich. I, the Nuggets are a better team. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't surprise. I thought they were going to win that series more easily. I obviously when I picked them. But the Clippers series, I didn't expect that per se. But I knew based on their history and also based on the players and the lack of ex- championship experience on that roster and the known crumbling. I don't say crumbling. It's not the right word. But like the known 3-1 deficit losing from that head coach, if you want to, if you want to phrase it like that. Like them coming back from 3-1 down against the Clippers – didn't surprise me at all. I mean, there's always going to be an uphill battle against the Lakers. They were they were definitely better. The Lakers have been better than just about everybody in the West. That's why they were number one seed. That's why none of their series have went past five games. Like they've been the best team in the in the playoffs, probably. Them and them and the Heat, which is which is why it's makes it makes sense why it's fair that they are the two teams that make it to the finals. Because they've been it's not like it's not like the Heat got lucky, it's not like the it's not like the Lakers got lucky. They, they they snuck by a team or like they had a lucky bounce or lucky break or like an injury or something like no these have been the two best teams in the playoffs on their respective in their respective conferences so it's only right that they it is only right that they get to play for the championship in my own personal opinion um but yeah so from next perspective like I said they're in this scenario where it's like they're a young team they'll be back and I get that point but I don't think the Lakers are going to be that much worse next year. I still have to figure out what they're going to do with like Kuzma and some of the other older guys on their roster, but like I don't expect a massive drop off from LeBron. Plus, I expect with maybe the championship pressure, if you want to call it that, taken off his shoulders from Anthony Davis in his first year, he probably will ascend to the best player on that team consistently night in and night out, and he'll probably have a good season. The Warriors are going to be back. Um, like I said, don't know how good they'll be, but. I said Steph's gonna be back. Clay's gonna be back. They're gonna have Draymond back. We'll see what they do with Wiggins and how they add in the first picker. Maybe they package them for somebody. Who knows what happens? Um, so they're not going anywhere. The the Clippers, as as much as you want to hate on them, they're not gonna be going anywhere. I don't think they're still gonna have Kawhi. They're gonna PG in their prime. Like that's they're gonna be a solid team next year. Um, the Blazers, if they said they needed to, they need to they need a little fine tuning with their bench, but. And again, if Melo comes back and they got Nurkic back and Collins back healthy and things like that, like they'll they'll be competitive team. Like they're not just going to go away. Um, I'm trying to think who else in the West. The Mavs, if they can make some additions, they'll be better. And well, also I guess assuming KP will be healthy, but that's not you can't assume that. So again, the West is always tough. Like you can't just assume, as I said with the Thunder. Thunder made the finals. The next thing you know, they're trading James Harden. They're there and then, like I said, they had bad injury luck. The next year, they were the best team in the conference. Had the one seed, best point differential, all that stuff. If I remember correctly, um, Pat Bev takes out Russ's knee. They lose in the second round to the Grizzlies. No, um, and again, that's a Grizzlies team they should have beaten, and they probably would have beaten with Russ. Twenty fourteen, um, Serge hurts his calf and is, and is basically playing on like one leg throughout the conference finals. When he does come back, I think he missed the first two games, and he came back for the two games in OKC, and was great. Um, but then, like I said, he just he just wasn't healthy. Uh, twenty fifteen, the whole team was hurt, and that was just a wash of a year. And they they still only missed the playoffs because of Anthony Davis double clutch buzzer beater. That I mean, again, he easily could have missed that shot, and then they make the playoffs, and then who knows what happens that year. But again, I guess they would have played. If they would have got the eight seed. They probably would have. Well, they would have played the Warriors that year, I think. Right? Were the Warriors the one seed that year, twenty fifteen? I believe so. Don't know exactly, but yeah, who knows what happens that year? And then twenty sixteen, we all know. Um, KD more or less had one foot out the door, and then they blew it through one lead. So, like I said, you can't just assume teams are going to be back. Because, as we've seen, we see that in every sport. You're like, oh, the Cubs are going to be the next dynasty, blah, blah, blah. They haven't been back to the World Series since they won. Um, like I said, you the Yankees have been 
I guess they haven't they haven't been to a World Series in what like since whenever they last won one in like oh nine I think it was something like that. Uh, the Dodgers they keep getting back, keep losing. Um, who else? The Astros. Well, they they cheated their way to a title, but again they got back. Did the playoffs other times did not win. They only won the one time. Like I said, winning winning championships in any sport is not simple. You can't assume, oh, because the team is young, they'll be fine. Like, dynasties in sports now, like the salary cap and the way things are positioned, are hard to come by. Plus, for Denver, and kind of the same thing with the Celtics, they don't attract major free agents. They don't. I said the LA teams do, the New York teams, well, mainly Brooklyn, um, do. Like I said, the Knicks have been a prime destination for years, but because of Dolan, no one goes there. Um, in Miami, obviously it's Miami, so they're aided by that. And they've been able to get lucky in that regard. They've gotten LeBron James in his prime, and then they got Jimmy Butler, and that's obviously helped. But you look at like the Sixers, they don't like Philly doesn't get that big of free agents. Um, the Clippers just really got their first f- big free agent. Um, the Lakers have struggled for years to get free agents. Then LeBron goes there, and obviously that changes the whole course of their situation. So again, the Denver Denver doesn't have that luck. They don't have the they have to build it organically, like the Warriors. And again, the Warriors. Lucked out because, A, Steph was on the most team-friendly contract in the league due to the fact that his ankles were all messed up um, early in his career, which, again, the, the Nuggets won't have because they are they have Jerry Malmer and a max deal. Jokic is getting paid good money, I believe. So, again, they, it's not like they have that. Um, so, like, they don't have that luck. So like, and then also they happen to have a free – have some cap space the, the one year – that the, the salary cap balloons and it just so happens to coincide with Kevin Durant being a free agent. So again, it's not like like they like that kind of luck does not happen for a smaller market teams. Like I said, look at OKC. With KD, the, the, like the second best player in the league for many years, they got no one. And the biggest free agent they were going to get was going to be Al Horford if he decided to play with, if, if KD came there. I think if, he, if KD stayed, he was going to come. And like I said, Al Horford's a fine player, but like that's not a big free agent get for like a championship caliber team. Like again, fine player, but that's not like if you're talking about like a team of championship aspirations, you're like, you know what, go out and get me Al Horford. That's not who you're that's not who you're thinking. Like I said Celtics have a similar issue because like because the whole city and the reputation that the city has with their fan base and different things, um, they don't really attract big time free agents either. So they gotta do everything organically. Like I said, the, the guys they got, even the big three they got, they had to, to acquire. It's not KG was like, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm going to leave and free agency and go to Boston. It's like, no, he has to get traded there, different things like that. Like I said, they already had Paul Pierce there, so that helped. But, again, it's not like it's not like you said, like LeBron didn't even think about going there. AD was like, don't send me there. Um, I don't think Kawhi wanted to go there. Like, again, all the big-time players, they don't want to go to Boston. It's right or wrong, they don't. This is Denver's gonna have to go the same thing. So they gotta build it organically. Um but like I said, they're gonna need to make some tough decisions. They gotta figure out what they're gonna do with Paul. Well, not what they're gonna do with Paul Millsap. He's gonna have to walk. Um Jeremy Grant has a player option. He's probably gonna opt out because he played great in the playoffs. He's gonna get a lot a lot of money on the open market. A lot of teams will be vying for his uh, services. <laughs> Maybe even the Lakers. Um funny enough, you saw LeBron out there. He was he was talking to him, but you know, there was a little recruiting recruiting hint that, that that conversation had to me at least because especially as the AD walked over there at the end for the camera cut it's like I said he's going to have a lot of options with the open market but you need him back he's the one guy on your, on your team that can defend any big guy um, so you going to need to figure out that you need to figure out what you do with Mike Porter Jr. because again with him in the lineup with a, 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 if they get him more involved in the offense like their offensive ceiling will be superb they can honestly have one of the best offenses in the league next year if they unlock his potential on the offense and like you utilize him more, but their defense could be abysmal if he continues to play like he does. And again, he had he has moments where he's locked in and has moments where he plays great. But like that's the thing, they're few and far between. Like there's other times where he'll he'll fall asleep on the help side and won't re- um, react quickly enough to the drive, or he'll he'll, he'll fall asleep and like he'll get a back cut and someone will get behind him. Like again, he has those lapses. But he's a young guy; hasn't played a whole lot of basketball since high school. Um, he played like the little bit at Missouri like, for like three games or whatever it was and didn't play his whole rookie year. And then obviously he's still kind of learning. 
Okay, so if that improves, all right, like you said, you saw Jamal Murray. Jamal Murray was a, a liability on the defensive end in the beginning of his career, and obviously it's grown, and he's gotten at least serviceable. He's not like a lockdown defender, but he's not terrible. He's not like they don't hunt him out anymore like that. So that's what you're hoping for Mike Porter Jr. But, yeah, they got to figure out that. Like I said, they got to figure out, well, because they didn't have Will Barton, and so that hurt because he's, he's another guy off their bench. Or if he would have started, who knows? They could have given them some buckets because he's like a 15-point-per-game score that they could have used that extra offense. Plus, he's a solid defender. He's not, like, again, not locked down, but he's not bad. I also got to figure out what to do with Gary Harris because I Gary Harris is not that good, in my personal opinion. Plus, he's hurt a lot. I mean, he's getting paid a lot of money. So you got to figure out what to do with him. Like, how are you going to handle that contract? Because they gave him, like, a decent deal, a four-year, $84 million extension in 2017. I think he has one year left. You should have one year left. Uh, no, he has two years left. Yikes. He had two years left. And like I said, he's getting paid 19 and $20 million. And I don't know if he's a $20 million player. In my own personal opinion. Again, like, he's a fine player, but again, you saw, like, he's just not his shooting. And again, obviously, he's working himself back in played most of the season. But again, like, he's 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 never played more than 76 games in the season. He's kind of always a little bit banged up. And then he's not, like, his shooting is not really like that. Like, he's never shot better than, well, he shot 42 and 39% in, in 2016, 2017, 2017, 2018. In the last two seasons, he shot... 34%, 33%. So like I said, they're going to need a little bit more offensively from him if he's going to be getting $20, $20 million a year. I mean, he plays solid defense, and that's nice, but again, um, you can't have guys out there that, like again, when they were passing the ball to him or Grant on the wings when Yoko was getting doubled or Murray was getting doubled, you need guys that can knock down the threes. Those guys, I mean, Grant had his moments, but Gary Harris, that's not what he was doing out there. He was not doing, he was not knocking down shots. But I said, Mike Porter Jr. out there, it's a different story. You can't, maybe you can't double because if you get the ball, Mike Porter Jr., he can knock down those threes. He can, he can drive, he can score, he can score in different ways. So, and that changes the whole offense. So, like I said, they got, they got tough decisions to make. Got to figure out what's, how they're going to be able to retain Jeremy Grant because if they lose him, that'll be a big blow to that team, in my opinion. Because obviously, especially Mike Porter Jr. is not going to be a, a, even a league average defender next year, most likely. They're going to need a, a guy that can defend some of the, the better wing players, the better big guys. And like I said, Mike Wood Jr. isn't that. Jeremy Grant can be that. Um, especially, and also with Paul Millsap, he's, he's, he was good for them, kind of brought a veteran presence. But I think they probably need to let him, you know, sit the bench if he's going to be back next year. And also, like I said, let let, let Michael Poor Jr. grow and flourish, in my personal opinion. But hey, we'll see what Mike Malone decides to do. Um, but yeah, like I said, when your team that doesn't, get free agents, you're going to have to try, find ways or game, you're going to have to find ways via trade to get guys, like I said, guys like a Jeremy Grant, um, find guys like a Monte Morris to be helpful off your bench, different things like that, you'll need those kind of guys, and maybe hopefully see what Bowl Bowl can do, because Mason Plumlee is not, a, you need a better backup big too, that's the other thing, like Mason Plumlee out there was useless, the way they want to run their offense, they run their offense with their center having a lot of responsibility at the top of the key with making the passes and making the right decisions and things like that, and you're going to need a big that can do that kind of thing. Maybe Bull Bull can. Maybe you play Michael Boyd Jr. and some backup five next year. You're going to have to figure some things out. But like I said, when Mason Plumlee just couldn't, they were double teaming uh, Murray on the pick and roll, and Mason Plumlee just couldn't make the decision that Jokic can do. No one, no most bigs can't. But like I said, for that team, you need a big that can. And it wasn't Plumlee. So you need to get a better, better backup big as well, in my opinion. You're going to need to improve that. So like I said, they got some decisions to make. Like I said, just the whole, as a fan that's seen it firsthand, this whole, like, oh, they're young, they'll be back. Maybe. Like, that's where I'm at. Like, maybe they will be. But like I said, don't just assume that. They're going to need to improve. And like I said, the West isn't easy right now. Like, it's going to be tough. It's always going to be difficult. Like I said, it's not like other teams aren't trying to get better. Like, the Pelicans will be better next year, potentially, if they have their guys healthy for a whole season. Maybe they make some additions. Like, this is not just going to be, like, oh, yeah, the Nuggets were a three seed. They'll be back in the West Conference Finals next year. Look at the look at the Blazers. They were in the West Conference Finals last year. Didn't even make it out the first round. Got smoked by the Lakers. It's not that easy. It's not. Unless you have, like, again, Jokic can be there, and I think Murray kind of ascended himself up a tier or two in the, in the rankings. 
of around the league. But again, unless you're going, unless you have one of like the elite elite players, assuming you'll be back and competing for a championship every year is a far fetched thing. Especially when you're a smaller market where you're not getting free agents, not getting those big big name players on a regular basis. You need to draft them, you need to grow them organically, um, or you need to get lucky like you did what the Warriors did with Steph and have him get hurt a lot so he was on a team-friendly deal and they, he, you have the room to sign a Kevin Durant so that by the time you give him the big $200 million extension, Kevin Durant's already under contract so it doesn't even affect you because you just sign him with the bird rights. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, again, good year for the Nuggets. They did their thing. They they made it about as far as people thought they could. They gave the Lakers at least a competitive series. It wasn't like they just got it, went out there and got smoked, but I think it's at the end of the day they just ran out of gas. And speaking of gas... It'll be playoffs start this week. The brackets are set. The matchups are set. So we'll talk about all those and give my little predictions. Because, again, baseball is so random, especially with the, these little three-game series. Um, it's it's You're going to, like, again, you're probably going to see upsets. You're going to see different things. Um, like I said, like, it's just, that's just the nature of baseball. And, like, no one thought the Nationals were going to win the World Series when they got to the playoffs last year. But, hey, that's what happened. So... I said, I'll give my little prediction and see how right I am as we go through. Um, we're after the break, so stay right there. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Brackets are as such in the American League. The one eight matchup. Well, this is again the MLB playoffs. In case you didn't know, uh, the the one eight matchup is the Rays versus the Blue Jays. You got the A's versus the White Sox, Twins versus the Astros, and Indians versus Yankees. That'll be a good one. And then in the National League, you got Dodgers versus the Brewers, uh, Braves versus Reds, Cubs versus Marlins, and Padres versus Cardinals. So we'll start with the AL. Um, I said shout out to the Blue Jays. Good season for them. They were able to, um, as a young team, get to the playoffs. Again, eight eight teams, but you know, to get to the playoffs. But the Rays have been the best team in the league. Well, obviously in the American League, the whole year. So it's hard for me to say that I should pick against them, given that. And now, like I said, but it's a it's a weird one because it's, it's in division. It's it's a division matchup. Like usually, those things are a little bit tighter. But like again, they're they don't really have as we've been through. They don't have like an excellent an excellent lineup. Like again, no one's no one on their team is really hitting great. But from a pitching standpoint, they are quite good. Um, they have Glass now, who's who's. I mean, he's been all right. But um, Yarborough, Snell, uh, Morin, who at least has playoff experience, and then the their back end has been quite, quite good, quite impressive. Um, Nick Anderson's been really good for them in 19 games. He has a .55 ERA, and so like I said, he'll be, he should be good for them when they get when they get to that postseason. Um, and like I said, that, that that's the thing about postseason play is usually if you can get five quality innings out of your starting pitcher, that'll that should usually be enough. So like I said, I think the Rays, at least in this one, should be fine. But again, this season's going to be weird. So it wouldn't shock me if, um, like I said, if anybody gets upset. 
And we're talking, when we're going next to the, uh, what was it? It was, it was A's. Actually, well, the only one I, the other one I remember is, um, is Indians, Yankees, off the top of my head. I was looking at it, but then obviously the ESPN app wants to be dumb. So that hates me. A is White Sox. So that's another interesting one because the White Sox apparently are undefeated against left-handed pitching this year, and I think at least the game one starter is going to be is going to be Manaya for the A's. I would assume, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure that's who they, they, they're. Um, I'm pretty sure that's who their number one is going to be for the first game. And I'm like, that's a dangerous game, though. They will, will be without Elo Jimenez, which hurts. Because he's a big, he's a big power bat. But again, they're going to have um, Abreu. They're going to have Tim Anderson. They're going to have Robert, who who had a, who had a three hit game, I believe, to, to end the season on Sunday. So that, like I said, that that helps them because um, you you needed some guys to get back on track um, before they get into the playoffs. So again, you don't want to be coming in, you don't want to be coming in cold. You would think, at least. Again, obviously, regular season, postseason, those different animals. But again, I know the the A's, again, if they don't do... I, I don't think they're going to pitch the other two lefties, but they do also have two other lefties in, um, in their rotation, in Lazardo and... And um, was it... No, not Fears. I think it was another one. And Minor, but again, well, I think it's going to go... Uh, I thought I saw someone was going to be Manaya, Fears, and then Bassett. You're going to be a three starters. Um, but then, again, on the flip side for their, their lineup, their lineup isn't great. Obviously, like I said, they lost Chapman, which hurt. But like I said, their, their lineup is like, it's like all right, but like they, they just play sound baseball. And like I said, for an experienced team like the White Sox, that could be an issue. Um, but again, they're just, their lineup is going to hit. And they got, like I said, they got two legitimate big time aces, if you want to call them that. I don't know if that's the. The right term, but obviously Giolito and Keuchel are two very good pitchers, and that's who that's what you want when it comes to postseason time. You want good pitching. And so they have two legitimate starters. Like I said, maybe in a five game series, seven game series, is a little bit different. But like I said Keuchel's been great, Giolito's been great, and they got to figure out whoever the game three starter is going to be. Whether it's Gio Gonzalez, whether that's Dunning, whether that's Cease, I don't know. But you know, also their bullpen has been very good. The, um, throughout the season, so they're going to have to count on them, and I think they should be able to count on them, uh, you would think. But also, like I said, they're, they're a young team. You just got to see how they handle their first pro season experience. Should be interesting. I, mean, I think that's going to be a good one, um, personally. Like I said, the other series is Twins Astros, so that's interesting because the Astros were able to make it back to the postseason, but obviously they don't have the pitching that they normally do have. Normally they have. Garrett Cole and Justin Verlander coming out the pen. Or not coming out the pen, but like pitching for them. And this year, that's not going to be the case. I think, I'm like I'm trying to think, who's there? I guess, what, Granky? And then, question marks? And from a pitching standpoint, at least in terms of like guys that will be ready to pitch in the postseason, have that kind of experience. And also, their lineup has been really, like they haven't hit that well this year. They just got lucky that the rest of the AL is not that good. Um, like I said, their their leading hitter for the season was Brantley, who's not bad. Um, but I'm trying to think. I think he got. I know he missed some time, but is he okay? So no, I think he'll he'll, he'll be all right. But like I said, um, Correa hit like 260, Altuve hit 219, Spring hit 265, um, Bregman hit 242. Obviously, they'll be without Jordan Alvarez, which he didn't, he only played like two games before he got shut down for the season. So you have to figure out what to do there, and like so they got Granky, they got. Um, Valdez, they got McCullers, um, so they got to got they got to have to figure some things out from that perspective. Because again, their starting pitching used to be the strength of their team, along with their hitting. But now it's a, more of a question mark in terms of postseason experience. So that's going to be tough for them. I say going against a Twins lineup, who at the very least you know they're going to hit. <laughs> at the very least, you know they're going to be able to hit the baseball. And like I said with suspect pitching, that that could very well be an issue for them. Obviously, Nelson Cruz was was great for them this year as like a forty year old. But again, you had other guys. You had um, Miguel Sano. Well, no, no, he had two hundred, but he had thirteen home runs. He's a big bat. Um, Rosario had thirteen home runs. 
Uh, the Bucks didn't have 13 home runs at 250. So again, they're not they're not the greatest hitting team, and also they're not the greatest pitching team. Even these in Toronto, the starting pitcher. Well, no, Maeda's been very good for them this year. He's 270, 270 ERA. Right. But most of the pitchers are like, yeah. And Barrios has been like all right. Um, Rich Hill's been all right. Uh, who else? Dobnak has been all right. That's like I guess he's probably like a reliever. They do like that little bullpen situation. And so they're a need to hit. Like this is going to come down to which team can hit because like the pitching is going to be a little shaky in my personal opinion, from what I can see. But it's going to be come down to who can hit. And I just I have more faith in the Twins right now than I do in the Astros. And then the Indians, Yankees. That's going to be a very interesting one because the one year the Yankees have a clear, bona fide, legitimate. Game one pitcher. Absolutely, they have to face the AL Cy Young winner and the best pitcher in the league this year in Shane Bieber in game one. And also, like, it's in, like a team like the, uh, the, the, the Indians, like, they can't hit the ball. Like, that's not, like, that's not an issue for, for them in the grand scheme of things. But also, like, Garrett Cole does give up some home runs and they're a team that can hit some home runs, like Jose Ramirez... Has seventeen on the year. You got um, you got uh guys like Lindor who have playoff experience. He's not going to be bad. And, um, Cesar Hernandez is hitting like two eighty this year. Fran Moray is hitting like two seventy five. And plus, like again, they got they got they got a good manager. They got Terry Francona. It's like you know they're not gonna, you know they're probably not gonna beat themselves in the playoffs. And again, this isn't the same. Indians team from like a few years ago they had like when they got to the World Series and stuff but again it's not a bad team at all and like I said now I try to be but they got Carrasco who's probably going to be there I imagine he'd be that game too he's been very good this year um so like I said there's a chance that the Yankees if they if they're Basco Cole because obviously they had the 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 they they had the May win the when the when the batting title and Lou Voigt led the league in home runs so like again they can hit you know they're going to be able to hit but just, like, will they be able to hit in the playoffs? That's always been their issue. That, like, their bats can go cold. When you, when you have a team with so much power and so much pop, and that's worried about, like, obviously, LeMay is worried about getting hit for average and things like that. But, like, a lot of the guys are worried about hitting home runs. That's their thing. That's what they do. That's what the Yankees do. So, like I'm saying, when you have that in the playoffs, it can be an issue, especially when you face good pitchers. Now, um, and I said um, Bieber, he's been with the Indians for a few years now, but, again, he's never been this good heading into the playoffs. So you can kind of see what kind of pressure that puts on him potentially. And obviously he's going to be facing the Yankees. That's going to be a big difference. Um, but yeah, we'll see how he does. Like I said, Carrasco, um, you, you got some other guys. I know please that's been good for them. Um, I don't know if, well, I wonder if he'll, I think he'll be back. Yeah, no, yeah, it should be. I don't, like I said, I don't know what the rotation is going to look like, but again, he should be able to pitch for them. He's been, like I said, he has a 2.28 ERA. So again, they they've had good starting pitching. And they've had good starting pitching this year, and if they can do that, especially against a team like the Yankees, and keep their bats quiet, when obviously the Yankees have Tanaka and Cole, but like again, Cole's not like uh, hasn't been the number one ace that he had been in years past, where he was basically like unhittable heading to the playoffs last year. Like that's not what he's been. And again, like again, um, it is what it is. Like he's not like he's been bad or anything like that. But that's just not where he's been at. Um, so we just have to see, like, can, can the pitching, um, stand up? That's, that's what I said. That's been their issue in the playoffs for years past. They've always been able to hit. They've never had, it's never been their problem, but it's like, are you going to have to, like, if you're, if you're bad, you're going to have to bat Gary Sanchez and if Gary Sanchez is going to have to be in the lineup, he's in 150, Aaron Hicks is going to have to be in the lineup, he's in 225, uh, even like labor when he's been healthy, he hasn't hit that great, um, like I said, like even like Judge once like once he started playing more, he hasn't been like he hasn't hit that great. Like like you're gonna you're gonna have guys come back or have guys be playing, and you know, or outside of the May, you 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 don't know if they're gonna be up there and not be guaranteed outs. Like I said, there's been different points in the playoffs for Sanchez and Judge and different state and different guys like that have been guaranteed outs almost against good pitchers. So you have to figure that out, see what happens there. So, so that's gonna be a tough one because I know. The one year that they actually do have some good starting pitching, two legitimate starters in the playoffs, just so happens that they're facing a team that also does have two, maybe even three, good starters. And one of them, again, being the Cy Young winner, so that's going to hurt. 
Um, so on the NL side, I mean, I'm still going to go with the Yankees. I trust their bats a little bit more. Personally, because, again, if they're hot, they'll be fine. But, if again, if they go cold, um, it could be a short postseason for the Yankees. NL side, Dodgers, Brewers. I mean, the Dodgers should should put that away pretty easily, you would think. Um, also, especially since, like, Corbin Burns, I'm pretty sure he's going to be out for the for the playoffs because he got hurt. So that's that that's going to be a big um, deal for the Brewers. Because he was their best pitcher this year. So, like, obviously, that, that's a big blow. That hurts a lot for them. Especially, like I said, when they're, they're already going to be an uphill battle just to even um, get... They just even just even beat the beat the Dodgers outright, and now I said you're going into it without one of your best pitchers. That's gonna hurt. Um, so that's what happens there. Second, second, the two seven is Braves Reds. So that's an interesting one because again, the Braves do have one really good pitcher in Max Free. Is that gonna be enough? I don't know, and that that's kind of where the issues come in. Is like, will that be enough to to keep them to keep them alive in the series? Obviously, the bat's going to be fine. The bat should be able to hit. That's cool. But again, then like they're going to face Trevor Bauer. He might be the Cy Young winner. Like who knows? Um, he's been very good this year. And like I said, like who can you trust in the bull in the in the rotation outside of Freed? And I said that's where. You're gonna run into issues with the Braves if you're the Braves, and that's where you, that's where I would be afraid if I'm a Braves fan. Is that like who are we gonna trust with that game two start or that game three start? And will they be worth trusting? I don't know, and that's kind of been the issue. But again, we'll kind of see how that goes. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where like hitting wise, they're the I mean they they were the second best team in the league in in um, batting average. They were second in home runs, um, so like I said, they were they were first in runs batted in. Like so, they're 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 first in hits. So like their offense is gonna be fine. It's pitching. Like I said, it's pitching where they're gonna be the issue. And so I said, we'll see how it plays out. But again, they were fifteenth in the league in ERA as a team. Where like I said, the Indians were second. That's why I'm a little scared for the Yankees. Um, even the Twins, even the Twins were fourth. So. I don't know, we'll see how that one plays out. But yeah, like I said, that, that's, what, that's what you're afraid of. Is like, can the bats carry the, the, the pitching? And like I said, when you're facing the Reds team, that like, they're they're not a bad pitching team. Not a bad pitching team at all. Um, so that's, like I said, that's, what, that's what's going to matter. That's, what's gonna, that's where it's going to come in here. Is like, can they do that? Like, can they, can they withstand that? Like, again, they were seventh in ERA as a team. The Reds were. So like I said, they get good pitching. Especially if they get good pitching from Bauer, and they get they get a good start from whoever else. They get a good start from Bauer, get a good start from Castillo or Sonny Gray or whoever. They decide the pitching games two and three, and like I said, you get enough hitting because their lineup isn't that good. But again, if you if you're facing bad pitching, that that's that that, that helps out a bad lineup quite a bit. So like I said I still going to go with the Braves, but like I said, this this is a that could be a shaky one potentially. Um, three six Cubs Marlins. I mean, you want to pick the Cubs because I mean, but like I just think it'd be a cool story if the Marlins at, at least won a playoff series that they got after they got in. But like I said, the Cubs probably had too much. Plus, I don't think the Marlins will have the starting pitching to keep up. Personally, again, who knows for sure? But again, personally, I just don't think they have, have the starting pitching. They don't have a U Darvish, which at the very least, like all right, that should give you one win. You would think, right? Like that, like all right, that should be enough to get us one win. Yeah, we'll see what happens from there. But all right, that should be enough to get you one win. Also, another interesting point: the the Indians and the Reds were the two best teams in terms of strikeouts as a team. So again, that's why I'm a little afraid for the Yankees. But also, like I said, that that could be a tough one for the Braves. That like their pitching is really good for the Reds. And like I said, if they don't, they shut down that lineup, and the Reds are facing a little bit worse pitching. Could could spell a, a potential upset. Like I said, they're going to pick the Braves. But yeah, the Cubs, I mean, the Marlins, that's a cool story, especially after all the COVID and things that they went through throughout the year. But I just have a little bit more faith in the Cubs, personally, just because, again, I try, but again, it just depends on how um, how they're how they're going to be hitting. They're just like, I mean, just, that's you can say that about every team. 
but again, just depends on how they're going to be hitting because they came. I mean, they came into the the playoffs um, scoring ten five and ten in their last three games against the White Sox. But before that, they were struggling. They lost three out of four to the Pirates, who aren't that good. They lost two out of three to the Twins. They so it's like they weren't playing that well heading into the playoffs. But again, um, with the Marlins, it's just one of those things where like it's a cool story, but like will it be enough? I don't know. We'll find out on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I just think they probably should be able to get it done personally. But we'll see how it plays out. Plus, I think they got a little bit more pop in their bats. But the I mean the Marlins have been playing well recently. They've won three out of the last five, while the like I said the Cubs have lost three out of the last five. But the offense will look better. So see how that plays out. And then four or five, the Padres are playing the Cardinals. I mean, I think the Padres should handle it. They've been the second best team in the league all year. Their lineup's great. Their their pitching should be solid. Um, well, I guess, well, again, it's just another team. They're like the White Sox. They're a young team. you got to see how they handle the postseason. Because, again, obviously they've been good during the regular season. But regular season not the postseason. you got to figure out how you're going to handle that. And like I said, you got to see how Tatis does in his first playoffs, see how Grisham does, see how Man Machado has been in the playoffs for a little while, how Will Myers does, how Cronenworth does, um, different things like that. you got to see how those guys handle the playoffs. Even, like, pitching-wise, you got to see how guys like Lamette handle it, how um, Davies, how Paddock, whoever they decide, however they decide to pitch it. I'm going to see that. I'm going to see how the bullpen handles it. Like I said, I, I, the Padres have been the best team and the, the second-best team in the regular season. I want to see that. One four Dodgers Padres, uh, NLDS series, but like I said, if if the if the Padres are a little too jumpy at the plate, they 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 start off a little slow. Um, I mean, the Cardinals still shouldn't have enough, you would think, but hey, I don't know. At least they have they they have the experience. They've been there. These guys have the, these guys are you guys are experienced. A lot of they a lot of veteran guys on that team had have been in these positions before. Um, so that, that that hurts them, that hurts like in ter- that helps them. I should say that hurt doesn't hurt them. That helps them. I mean, even with them, I guess it did depend on who's going to pitch. But like Wainwright, he's a little bit older, but he's been pitching well this year. Two one five year either Flaherty, he's he hasn't been that great. Uh, so like I said, I don't know who they're going to go with as their starters for the series. But then even like their bullpen. You know, the bullpen hasn't been bad. Let me not let me not hate. The bullpen hasn't the bullpen's been alright. The bullpen's been alright. I was like going through the ERAs and the whips and things like that. Like they're the bullpen's not that bad. But again, I want Padres Dodgers, so that's why I'm picking the Padres. So yeah, just going through like I said, go through it one more time. Um an AL Rays. I'm gonna go to White Sox in an upset just because I think, like I said, if the offense is hitting like it could be, plus like then they haven't lost to a left handed pitcher. And they got two legitimate stars. I think you can get, take the White Sox there. The Twins, I think, should be able to handle that. And I think I'm going to go with the Yankees, but like the Indians beating them would not shock me at all if the pitching for the Indians is on. And I said that they're lead the league in strikeouts. Their 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 rotation's been very good throughout the year. If they can get enough Tommy hitting, which I should be able to, it's a veteran team. I see the Yankees getting up out of there, but we'll see about that. Then in the NL Dodgers, I think the Braves. I think this is probably going to be a little bit more chalk, at least how I pick it. Um, we're gonna go Dodgers, gonna go Braves, but again, it's another situation where if they run into it, they run into a Reds team. If they're pitching well, uh, the Braves could be in trouble because again, their their pitching is is not nearly as good, especially for a playoff team. It's been it's very it's very average at best outside of like I said outside of free. It's really not all that um all that like you're not you're not that afraid of their rotation. And so I'm gonna go with the Cubs, even though the Mars would be a good story. But I think I'll go with the Cubs there, and then. And then Padres, just because I want that Padres Dodgers series. But again, it's a weird. It's three game series, not that long. Um, weird circumstances, weird situation. You're gonna see a wild postseason. You're gonna see. You're gonna see upsets. You're gonna see crazy things. So like I said, just, it start up this week. We'll kind of um, keep an eye on it, go through it as it as it happens. But like I said, should be interesting. Should be fun. Um, and playoff baseball is always fun, regardless of how many games it is, who's in it, um, different things like that. It's always entertaining. It's always Exciting. Um, I still say that that obviously it's unfortunate because they cheated. But whatever that game five was against the Dodgers and Astros like a couple years ago in the World Series, one of the best sports games period I've ever watched. 
just going back and forth with the home runs and the timely hits and everything. Like I said, playoff baseball is great. Recommend. Just like, I mean, just like um, playoff hockey is great as well. If you're not a, because a lot of people watch M- NBA and NFL, but like if you're not a, if you're just a more casual MLB fan or casual NHL fan, watch the playoffs. And even if you're just a casual sports fan, period, watch the playoffs. That'll, that'll be, that'll be really fun and really entertaining. So, like I said, we'll look forward to that. See how it all plays out. I think it starts up Tuesday. Or most of the games start up like Tuesday, Wednesday. So once once the games are going through, we'll kind of see how it plays out, and we'll we'll know um, by the end of the week, or potentially by the or or even the weekend if it goes. I think the series go three. Um, who's going to make it on, and who's going to get upset? Who's going to get eliminated? Different things, but yeah, should be fun to say the least. And speaking of fun, there were some fun and interesting games that went down over the on Saturday in college football. So we'll discuss those and some of the surprising outcomes and things like that right after the break. So stay right there. Check out the show built around the women of MMA from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. We got the fights covered. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Could start with LSU and how defending national champs looked very shaky, at least on the defensive end, in the first game post Joe Burrow, Joe Brady, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase opts out, uh, Clyde Edwards, Lair, all those guys, era. But we're going to start with the Big 12 because boy, did the Big 12 try to screw themselves. Big time. Um, and obviously, again, it's, the, it's not, uh, I don't want to say it's anyone's fault per se, but again, with the two conferences not having started, um, potentially having your two best teams lose in the same weekend to unranked opponents, um, basically, I don't want to say all but ruining, but trying to ruin whatever shot you guys had at the playoff, probably not the best look. In my own personal opinion, I would, I would say don't do that. Um, try to, uh, beat the team you're supposed to be in the house again when the Texas and the Oklahomas and the Oklahoma States of the world, when they match up, all right, okay, whoever is the best out of there. Well, we'll see from there. But, again, you shouldn't have multiple teams potentially losing that first weekend. Well, not the first weekend, because I guess, well, this is their... How many games have they played? This is their second week of games that they've played. Yeah, everybody is, like, either 0-1 or 1-1 and or or 2-0, and different things like that. But we'll start with Oklahoma. Because, I mean, I get there are any experiences this is the first year they haven't had, like, a veteran quarterback under center. Again, obviously, they went from Baker Mayfield to Kyler Murray to Jalen Hurts. Like, all those guys had experience at the quarterback position before like before stepping foot um, on the field their last years, before they left for college. Again, Jalen Hurts had experience. Kyler Murray hadn't played a whole lot, but again, he's a junior. Baker Mayfield, I guess, would play two years under Lincoln Ross. So again, it's not like the, the, these guys weren't freshmen when they were getting out there. Which is, again, obviously, so why you got to give Spencer Rattler a little bit of leeway, per se. But you're also not supposed to lose to Kansas State at home. But you're just not supposed to do that. Especially when a lot of the reason why they lost was because Spencer Rattler wasn't as good as he could be. And also, they, they, they I mean, I'm not going to say they, they were, they went full Falcons. But they were up 35-21, heading into the fourth quarter. Then they just let... Now, again, that's not the right word because it's not like Kansas State isn't trying, but they allowed the Kansas State offense to get going there in that fourth. Um, Scott Thompson got going through a touchdown pass. No, he ran for a touchdown, excuse me, to, to turn the lead to seven. 
then Vaughn a nice little forty yard touchdown run to, to to tie the game, and then I was gonna keep the field goal with like four minutes left, and in that time as the I mean again in fairness Spencer Rattler started the first drive of the game with a pick, so you kind of knew what you knew what it was, but then again he was able to get other things going, so you were, you didn't mind as much. You're like all right okay for scoring touchdowns we can live with the picks. I mean. I don't say live with the place the right word, but again, and also on top of that, they were up 35-21 heading to the fourth. They were up 35-14 in that third quarter. So that like that's what really hurts. Now you shouldn't lose a 21 point lead in in like a quarter, but again, that's what happens when you allow a three play 75 yard drive. Again, like I said, one one deep pass. And um, they're down at the Oklahoma two yard line, and so that hurt. And also, again, it's not just it wasn't just the, the it wasn't just the interceptions. They also had a fumble that uh, Kansas State recovered that led to a touchdown. And then again, the offense just went stale. After they tied it up, they went on a they they had to punt after a five play one yard drive, and that then allowed uh, Kansas State to take a field goal. Then they got the ball back at the punt and went three and out. Then they were able to get the stops necessarily to be able to punt it back, to get Kansas to punt it back to them. And then two plays later, Spencer Rattler threw an interception. So it was one of those things. Again, Spencer Rattler is young. He'll learn from this. He'll, he'll grow from this. But, again, as, the, as a as a third-ranked team in the country, it's not a game you're supposed to lose. And especially as an Oklahoma, led, as an Oklahoma team, that you're not supposed to lose because of your quarterback. Like, if you lose because you gave up 50 points, all right, that's one thing. But you know, they're not used to their quarterback again being young and inexperienced and two, throwing through interception in the game for them to lose. That's not normally how they lost games. They lost games on the defensive end. Not because they were turning the ball over. Like I said, that that hurt for them. And then obviously on the defensive end, they didn't really do a whole lot. Um, so that didn't help. But again, Spencer Rather, he'll learn and he'll grow from this, you would think. This is definitely a tough a tough pill to swallow for a loss. Again, second game of the season. And you already have your first loss in, in a game. And you haven't played Texas, haven't played Oklahoma State. Haven't played, like, Texas Tech. You haven't played TCU. Like, you know, there, there, are, there are potentially better teams. Especially when Kansas State lost to Arkansas State the week before. Like, that, that, like in theory, that's not supposed to be a team you, you lose to. But here we are. So, that, like I said, that one hurts for, for Oklahoma. That one hurts. So now they got to get right next week against Iowa State. No, it's just not a bad team. Then they play Texas in two weeks. So, yeah, they kind of can't afford another loss. If they want to have a shot at the big, at the playoff again, if I don't know if they'll that'll be them, but again, if you want to have a shot at the playoff, you can't lose games you're supposed to win. You can't lose games you're supposed to win, especially again as a non-SEC team, because again, the Big Twelve and the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, maybe even like maybe. Like, maybe as a Pac, a Big 12 team, depending on who you are. Like, if you're Ohio State, like maybe you get the benefit of the doubt. Georgia, Alabama, those kind of schools, maybe get the benefit of the doubt. But like I said, Oklahoma, mm, they're not going to get the benefit of the doubt, unfortunately. So that one hurt. And then, like I said, Texas did the best to take what Oklahoma had done for them and be like, oh, we now have a shot to maybe be that Big 12 team again to the playoff. And they did everything they could to squander it. Um, they were in a, a literal shootout um, with, with Texas Tech. Um, and had it not been for uh, for Bowman, a lot earlier and a lot sooner. And that was the unfortunate part for Texas Tech is that they had, I had so many opportunities to get to extend this lead. So many opportunities. And like I said that that's what hurts the most is that like because of those opportunities, you you like again they 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 got a touchdown, they got it to seventeen fourteen, and get the onside kick. Great play, great, not play call, but great call to be able to get them. You knew, like, all right, maybe the Texas guys, they, they drop back too far after the kick. You have the little kicker do a little 10-yard thing, wait for it to go 10 yards, and then he picks it up. Next play, Bowman throws an intercept. Very next play. So that one hurt, then Texas scored a touchdown. Now they're down 24-14, but then they're able to drive back down the field and score. Then they force a punt. Um, no, they're forced to punt. And then, and then they blocked the punt. Yeah, that's what it was. They blocked, they they forced the Texas the punt after they cut it to three. Then they blocked the punt. So they got good field position at the Texas seventeen. 
Then two plays later, after a, uh, a loss of six, um, Bowman throws an interception that's returned 71 yards back to Texas Tech 19. And, and Texas Tech, I mean, Texas scores a touchdown four plays later. So again, in that first half, they had multiple opportunities to score more and be up bigger after bad special teams plays by Texas. And Texas Tech could not capitalize. So then, like I said, at the end of the game, when they're, when they're able to um, get up big, uh, like I said, they 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 were able to get up forty one, well fifty six forty one, on on Texas after a long run by Thompson, like three minutes left. Mind you, it's three minutes left in the game. I mean, I know it's Big Twelve, but three minutes left in the game. You're not supposed to lose that, but whatever. Um, so they go up, and then they allow a four play <laughs> touchdown drive in thirty four seconds. Then, because of course they get the onside kick because it goes through a guy's hands, and and then six plays later, and then the end zone again. So they tie the game up, and then and then obviously you get um then they went to overtime because they were text that wasn't able to get move the ball. Then they score first in overtime, and then um, things go backwards for Texas Tech, and then they throw an interception. So again, you're up fourteen. Yeah, you're up fourteen points with like three minutes left, and you blow the lead. Again, after you gifted, you were gifted good field position twice, and Bowman threw interceptions. So, like I said, that's why I know it hurt for Texas Tech. Again, that's a game they should have won. Is against a rival, and they had the. Not only did they do all the blunders, do all the mishaps. Like again, you get you get good special teams play, and you give it right back immediately. Even through all that, they were up two scores with like three minutes left, and they lose. You know, I mean, again in overtime, but they lose. Like I know, like that, that's a tough one. So. I said on the Texas side of things, I don't know what happened. Like in their defense, non-existent other than the interceptions. Like outside, they, they didn't get the interceptions. Their defense did little to nothing. I mean, Bowman threw for what, three hundred twenty-five yards, five touchdowns, and and the guy Thompson ran for 100, 104 yards and two touchdowns. So the offense was able to move the ball fairly easily on them. Granted, it's so Texas is offense, but again, that's Big Twelve football for you. The offense can move up and down the field. That's what it is. But yeah, like I said, that that's the game that shouldn't have been that close, shouldn't have taken overtime, shouldn't have taken overtime, excuse me. But at the end of the day, Texas got the dub. And when in, in the in a day when Oklahoma loses, all you need is the dub. All you need is the dub. Like I said, to just just to be able to be like, all right, okay, now we sh- now we'll be ahead of them. And like I said, they they got some yeah you know, Texas TCU coming up. Then they got te- then they got Oklahoma, then they got Baylor, then they got Oklahoma State. And like I said, they they have to go through some games of their own, and we'll see how they play. But again, after Oklahoma caught the L, Texas needed to win this game, and look at like they weren't going to win this game, and they found a way to win this game. So you can't like I said, you can't squander that opportunity, that moment where you win a game you shouldn't win, and on the same day where your biggest competition in the, in the conference loses. And like I said, you just can't squander that. So we'll see how that goes. But then like I said, we want to talk about SEC real quick. Um, well, first I will actually would touch on the fact that Miami and De'Ara King looks amazing. They smoked Florida State. Florida State is not back. Uh, Miami is now 3-0. King, 29-40, 267 through two touchdowns. Also ran 65 time, for 65 yards on eight carries. So again, he looks like everything they wanted him to look like um, once he transferred there. So that's going to help them because, again, they're going to need to they're gonna need to keep pace with the Notre Dames and the Oklahomas, and not the Oklahomas, the Clemsons of the world. If they want to have a shot, they're competing for the ACC title. And I imagine that's what they got him there for. But again, SEC, just want to touch on that real quick. Alabama still looked like Alabama. They they put it on Missouri, um, Florida Florida put on Ole Miss, Auburn handled Kentucky, but LSU. And again, I don't know if they should have been the sixth ranked team just because again they they lost a lot of guys, and also apparently Stingley was out with an illness, which apparently wasn't COVID related, but like very interesting. Um, again, I don't hope it was COVID, but at the same time that clearly hurt. Because, again, the team was already without a bunch of their key guys from last year. Again, not even just offense. Like, Delpit, um, Patrick Queen, 
Uh, I'm trying to think who else they lost. Uh, Chase on, like, again, they lost a lot of pieces from that um, championship team. And these things, going to be one of the guys returning. He's going to be back. And, again, he couldn't play. And, clearly, they needed him because they gave up uh, <laughs> a record 623 yards to K.J. Costello in his first game in, in SEC. And, like I said, I didn't watch a whole lot of K.J. Costello at Stanford, but I know he never did this. I know he never did this. And, again, it's just, like, one of those things where, like, um, where it just it, it, it raised a question of the level of offense in the SEC. Again, that's been a lot of the things that, oh, the SEC is so competitive, the defense is so great, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, are they great because the quarterback plays bad and the offenses are kind of antiquated? Or are they good because the defenses are good? I mean, Alabama was in, like, the Georgia. And, like, the teams have had good defense. So that's not, as you've seen in national championships and things like that. So, like, they've won national championships. It's not like their defense has been bad. But, like, as you've seen in recent years, Alabama's struggled when they've gone up against the Clemsons of the world or the LHUs of the world. Like, you've seen great offenses dominate in, like, dominate in the SEC and also dominate SEC teams. Once they get to the championship, you saw with Ohio State, like again, um, Florida State, like beat Auburn, like again, like you've seen in recent years, SEC teams get out of the SEC, and and they play better offenses and things go a little bit differently than they had been. And again, this is a more recent thing. Obviously, the Alabamas of the world and SEC has has been very dominant in the last twenty years, um, and when it comes to championships and things like that. Again, that's found it interesting that the first game the Air Raid was in the SEC. All of a sudden now, Brothers is going for for her career highs and breaking records. Just again, it's very interesting timing, to say the least. Um, but yes, yeah, so I know Mike Leach was happy. Uh, I know KJ Costello was happy that he was able to leave um, the, the, uh, the, I don't want to say antiquated, but maybe the outdated, more run-heavy offense of Stanford and get into a more pass-heavy offense. And now he has an SEC record for passing yards. And we'll see how long it lasts. And and obviously, like I said, they were without their best corner, LSU was. But you could just see that this is going to be a different year. This isn't this isn't the same LSU team that they had last year. And again, that, that's fine. That's fair. I didn't expect it to be the same. But you see, it's not going to be that. It's not going to be as easy. It's going to be a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. And hopefully, they're ready for the task. Because again, it's um, it's going to be a very very different year. But again, college football is back. Sports are back. Well, not sports. I've been back. But college football is back. It was a fun Saturday. There was a lot of good games across the college landscape on Saturday. A lot of very entertaining games. Like I said, the Oklahoma game was entertaining. Texas, Texas Tech was entertaining. This Watching Florida do their thing was entertaining. Watching, like I said, Derek King. Or, uh, I, think the, I think it's happening. Yeah, I, mean, I want to make sure I'm saying his name right. Yeah, I don't want to. Like I said, that would be disrespectful for me to. For do it wrong, be a Derek King. He played well, and obviously, like I said, watching KJ Costello and Mike and Mike Leach tear up the defending national champions it was it was quite impressive to say the least. So, um, like I said, with college football back, should be a lot more fun Saturdays ahead, and that's even before we get to the Big Twelve, Big Big Ten, excuse me, and Pac twelve coming back as well in the not so distant future. But that'll do it for me here today on the GSMC Sports Podcast presented by GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys as always for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode. Make sure you're always on top when we drop our latest stuff. Also, if you could please as well, give us a five-star rating. Or ask us to review wherever you listen to your podcast. It'll be appreciated. Very helpful. See us. Allow us to see what you guys like, what you guys dislike, the ways we can improve. All that fun stuff. And also, if you're on social media, we're on social media. So you can find us there. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We can talk. We can chat. We can debate. We can discuss anything in the sports land. Because like I said, you want to talk about thing about Game 6, the Alexander Cup Finals, because Dallas Stars got the overtime winner on Saturday. So I think Game 6 is Monday. See if the Lightning can close it out or we get a Game 7. Two best words in sports. Um, talk about your predictions for them will be playoffs. Talk about your predictions for Ravens Chiefs. And talk about which coaches you think are on the hot seat in the NFL. Get your finals previews, everything. Like I said, anything you want to discuss? Feel free to reach out to us, and we can discuss it. I said, doesn't doesn't matter the sport. Um, before I get out of here, like I always do, want to give a shout out to the essential workers that have been working tirelessly through this pandemic. So, first responders, EMTs, doctors, nurses, uh, firefighters, postal service workers, retail workers, um, grocery store workers, um, UPS, FedEx, Amazon, all those guys that are allowing people like me to stay home and stay safe, or even when we go out to be safe. And again, maybe have to interact with people that may not take the pandemic as seriously as maybe they should. 
Um, like I said, I know it's a lot to deal with, especially during this time where everybody's a little bit more stressed than they would be on, in any given year. Um, so I know, like I said, you guys are the unsung heroes of this and should be appreciated as such. So don't get any appreciation from anybody else. You will at least get it from me. <sighs> also, if you're going to go out to bars, go out to restaurants, things of that nature, make sure, like I said, I mean, not make sure, but just like try to tip your waiters, waitresses, um, bartenders, things like that. I know, like I said, they'll, it'll be, it should be very appreciated during these times. I think I'm not asking anyone to go above and beyond their means if they don't they, they don't have like that. I know everybody's financial situation is a little bit different due to the pandemic. So if you can, like I said, I'd imagine it would be greatly appreciated. Also, wear a mask. It's very simple. It allows to be done with the sooner rather than later. Obviously, the vaccine and things will be much more beneficial. But that uh, widespread vaccine isn't coming anytime soon. Obviously, they say there should be one by the end of the year, but like. Not everybody's going to take it because no one's going to take the first trial of the vaccine. No one wants to take the first trial of the vaccine. You want to make sure it works first, which I understand. I know I won't be doing that. I, I take vaccines, but I'm not going to take that first one, at least. Um, But yeah, so wear a mask. Um, But yeah, that'll do it for me here today. I've been Chris Blades. That has been my time. And until and next time, peace out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.